Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will convene our board of directors meeting for Thursday, December 6th. I'll ask Elaine if she would please call roll. Ex officio board member Bruins. Here. Board member Carr. Here. Board member Chavez. Here. Alternate board member Cortese. Alternate board member Davis. Board member Diep. Alternate board member Harney. Alternate board member Hendricks. Board Member Jones, Board Member Camis, Here. Board Member McAllister, Here. Board Member Nunez, Board Member Perales, Here. Alternate Board Member Rennie, Here. Board Member Vianathan, Board Member Yeager, Vice Chairperson O'Neill, Chairperson Licardo. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Elaine. Please join me and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. We'll start with item 1.3. Uh, that is the chair and vice chair elections. That is the election for the board's leadership roles for the calendar year 2019. In the words of Richard Nixon, you won't have me to kick around anymore. So as mentioned last month, I know, lots of applause. Um, as mentioned last month, the established rotation states that the 2019 board chair shall be selected from the representatives from the Northwest, Northeast, West Valley, and South County city groups. Uh, the board vice chair will be selected from the representatives of Santa Clara County. Uh, we'll conduct separate elections for chair and vice chair. Uh, first, with regard to the election of new chair, uh, I have one letter of interest from our current vice chair, uh, Vice Chair O'Neill. Uh, that is in your packet. May I have nominations for chairperson? Thank you. Uh, motion and second. I strongly support the motion. Are there any comments? All right. If not, then are there any other nominations from the floor? May I have a motion to close nominations? All right. I heard a motion, I believe, from uh, Member Chavez and a second, I think, from Member McAllister. All right. Uh, wait a minute. How is it I need two motions? Oh, we have a nomination. Now we have to have a motion. Okay. All right. I'm going to do this again. May I have a motion to elect Teresa O'Neill for chair in 2019? Okay. I'm just reading the script. That's all. <laughs> all right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Fabulous. Congratulations. Thank Teresa. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll proceed now to the election for vice chair for 2019. Wouldn't it be great if national elections worked this way? Um, we received a letter of interest from board member Chavez. Uh, I believe there are no other letters uh, that have been submitted. A copy of letters included in your packet as well. May I have nominations for vice chair? I nominate Cindy Chavez. All right, a nomination in a second. Uh, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, may I have a motion to close nominations? All right. May I have a motion to elect uh, member Chavez as vice chair? So moved. All right. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. You got to think fast here. All right. I'm going to allow our, our recently arriving members to take their chairs for this momentous vote. Uh, the motion on the floor is uh, uh, for uh, Supervisor Chavez to be vice chair. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations, Supervisor Chavez. Okay, uh, on to orders of the day. That's item 1.4. We have an addendum to tonight's agenda, item 5.5.x. That is the recommendation of the Ad Hoc Financial Stability Committee. Um, staff is requested to hear the policy-related items together. Those are items... 7.1 through 7.3, uh, and to defer closed session agenda items 9.1b, uh, that's the conference with legal counsel on existing lit lit litigation, and 9.1c, the conference with real property negotiators. 
uh, before you breathe a sigh of release. I think we still have five other items on closed session agenda, so lots to do today. Um, I also had a personal request for a deferral, uh, and that is of item 7.2. Uh, that is VTA land use and development review policy. I would request that that might be deferred until January. Uh, so uh, those are the requests. Are, uh, is there a motion? Uh, Councilmember Pross. I have a question first, if that's all right. Sure. Um, so I think we were going to hear 7 1, 7 2, and 7 3 together. So is that correct? Yeah, theoretically, if there were a deferral on 7 2, then that would not be heard. That would be heard until that would be heard in January. But is the staff, can, is there kind of any reason why we should be hearing them all together and will we defer all of them to January? Or, or is it fine on staff's account to I think there is defer some time just sensitivity one of them? On yeah. Okay. I was told there was some time sensitivity on one of those items. Okay, it sounds fine. I, I didn't know if it was going to be okay. an issue. So, so I think we can I'll, pretty much proceed as we like. I'll make the, ma the motion then as you described. Okay. Motion from Director Perella, second from Director Davis. All right, any comment on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, that proceeds. Uh, Director Chavez, did you want? Okay. Okay, uh, we're on to awards and commendations. Um, the biographies of our retirees for item 2.1 will be read by Chrissy Victoria, our associate HR analyst. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our retirement recognition. Our first commendation goes to Russell Anderson. Russell Anderson is a supervising maintenance instructor. He began his career with the Santa Clara County Transit District in 1977 as a service worker. Russell was promoted to several job classifications and finally to supervising ma maintenance instructor in 2007. Russell was an industry leader helping shape the diesel and heavy duty vehicle maintenance training in the local community and then the public transportation maintenance community by his appointment as the panelist for the Transit Cooperative Research Program and as a member of the American Public Transportation Association National Bus Maintenance Training Committee. Russell provided 41 years of distinguished public service and was a valuable asset to VTA. Congratulations to Russell Anderson. Our next one is for Carmelo Gallo, badge 3022. <laughs> Carmelo is our coach operator who began his career with the Santa Clara County Transit District in May of 1987 as a coach operator. Carmelo demonstrated passion for his work and commitment to safety throughout his career and attained 29 years of safe driving, earning the prestigious 2 million miles operator safety award. Carmelo was an exceptional coach operator, displaying a high level of professionalism and was highly respected by all who knew and worked with him. Carmelo provided 31 years of distinguished public service and was a valuable asset to VTA. Congratulations to Carmelo Gallo. We have a few retirees who are not able to attend today, so let me congratulate them. One is Pamela Pope, bus dispatcher, who provided 38 years of distinguished public service. Alexander Chrysalis, bus dispatcher, who provided 32 years of distinguished public service. And finally, Ali Huda, deputy director of accounting, provided 30 year, 32 years of distinguished public service. Congratulations to all our retirees. Moving on to 
on to item 2.2. This item is to recognize employees or departments that go above and beyond the call of duty, whether it's in something that directly applies to their job or is related to something they do for others, as in the case of the incredible generosity of two departments we are honoring tonight. May I ask Lucas Perez, representing the Customer Service Department, Mimi Nguyen and Jennifer Stanislaw, representing Cerrone Bus Yard, to join our chair and general manager. In addition to several other charitable efforts our employees engage in, VTA employees also participate every year in collecting food for the Second Harvest Food Bank. This year, our employees broke all records by collecting more than 7,000 pounds of food from families in need this holiday season. This is enough for more than 8,400 meals. Thank you, customer service and Cerrone Bus Yard for your generosity. Next, we're moving on to item 2.3, which is a resolution of appreciation for outgoing VTA board member Ken Yeager. Okay, so do we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution, to adopt the resolution? And then, okay, uh, okay, uh, all those in favor? Aye, opposed? Okay, we are adopting resolution. Okay, so board member Yeager is joining um, Mayor Licardo and General Manager Fernandez. Whereas Ken Yeager is leaving the VTA Board of Directors having served for 17 plus years and whereas Ken Yeager held various leadership roles during his tenure, serving as the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors in 2011 and Chairperson in 2012 and as Vice Chair of the Audit Committee in 2011, the Silicon Valley Rapid Transit Program Working Committee in 2012 the Transit Planning and Operations Committee and El Camino Real Rapid Transit Policy Advisory Board in 2016, and whereas Ken Yeager supported the expansion of VTA's minority and women-owned business enterprise program to include the disabled veteran and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender business enterprise programs in 2016 to encourage greater participation in VTA's procurement process by members of these communities, and whereas Ken Yeager admirably served on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Joint Powers Board, and whereas Ken Yeager championed the 30-year and one-half cent local transportation sales tax known as Measure B, which passed in November 2016 with the support of more than 71% of the Santa Clara County voters, as well as 2008 Measure B that authorized an eight cent sales tax to support the operation of BART, served on the Silicon Valley Rapid Transportation Board, BART. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the VTA Board of Directors hereby commends and expresses his sincerest appreciation to Ken Yeager for his exemplary public service and dedication to public transportation, be it further resolved, this resolution is presented with gratitude and good wishes of VTA, adopted by the VTA Board of Directors, 6th day of December, 
gather. Let's kind of get the shorter people in the front. I don't know how to say that nicely. Then maybe the taller people in the back. Jeannie? Jeannie, we can't see you, so maybe come to the front and stand in front of the person in the card. Mayor Licardo? Yeah. Everybody's head is in between. And Chair, Vice Chair O'Neill, can you go to your left a little bit? Perfect. And then, Claudia, you're going to come over here. Go ahead. Remember, Jaeger, I'm going to have you come to your left a little bit. And then remember Chavez, the other was here, that's perfect. Oh wait, yeah, yeah, but I don't think, can you see? Remember Carr, a little bit here, that's perfect. There we go. I think we got everybody. Okay, yeah. Okay, ready? One, two, three. I'm going to do a bunch of them. Some quick. One, two, three. Look, if you guys like each other, there you go, I'm playing. So fine. Great, perfect, thank you. Uh, Director Yeager, would you like to offer a rebuttal? <laughs> no, just, I just want to say a, a, a few words and to, uh, you can keep that picture up all, all during the meeting. <laughs> and, uh, just to express my thanks, and I promise to be shorter than all those whereases that uh, the vice chair had to read, but it really has been an honor to work with the VTA family for uh, the last 18 years and Serving on uh, VTA has allowed me to sit on other regional boards and sort of tie that uh, connection between our transportation needs and those uh, in our region. As uh, Jeannie and other people who have worked on regional issues know that often the other eight counties and the nine Bay Area counties uh, often forget about Santa Clara County. They don't really understand our needs and focus more on their issues and sort of work a more uh, together against Santa Clara County than they really should and one of the things I'm most proud of is getting that uh, vote for San Jose uh, on MTC and trying to get a little better representation than we've yeah. uh, ever had <laughs> and I know uh, Scott Hayward is uh, in the audience and uh, he spent a lot of time up there on MTC really making sure that uh, our needs uh, were heard um, also, very proud of everything that I was able to do with Caltrain. Pretty amazing that I was on that board for 17 years, and of course, Jeannie is on it now. And trying to um, keep the trains moving, particularly at times during the recession when uh, ridership was dropping and we were really in a financial crisis and weren't sure whether we'd even be able to continue on, we decided to increase the number of trains and, and institute the baby bullet and uh, trying to up the service and it really meant that we had higher ridership than we've ever had before and we've been sort of dealing with the higher ridership needs um, and as we move forward to uh, forward on electrification we'll be able to transport more people as well uh, very proud of the getting the funding for the 280 880 uh, interchange uh, it's really worked out unbelievably well we were very fortunate, um, again, with tying MTC with the uh, California Transportation Commission uh, during the recession when the bids were coming in 
uh, under what the um, estimates were. We ended up having additional dollars in the CTC, and so we were able to get that interchange funded. Um, BART, certainly, uh, we uh, still anxiously await it, but certainly from going back to 2001 with all the votes that were needed to be able to get it. One thing that hasn't really been talked a lot about was getting the extension uh, from BART to Warm Springs, which then enable us to uh, connect it. The situation was always that BART wouldn't go to Palm, um, uh, Palm Springs, wouldn't go to Warm Springs <laughs> until um, Santa Clara County had the commitment to take it uh, to the border, and we were able to accomplish that. Uh, very proud of the work that we've done in trying to um, uh, hire more minority businesses. Um, our general manager really should be congratulated for the effort, extra effort that has gone into uh, making sure that all businesses in, in the county uh, un understand what the process is, are and to be able to be granted their awards. And I think we're at an all-time high as far as contracts with minority-owned uh, businesses. And certainly very proud of the work uh, with the LGBT community and making sure they're represented and that all of our LGBTQ uh, employees um, feel wanted and, uh, and are, are praised for their good work. And, uh, and lastly, and, I, and last but not least, one of, the most, one of the best hires that I ever had, and I've made a lot of hires over the last 18 years, was uh, the hiring of our general manager, Nuria Fernandez. Is she has really brought the organization up to a whole higher level. I was a little worried because of her background in Chicago and D.C. and New York that being out here in um, Santa Clara County might just be a little bit too boring for her. But as it turned out, that has not been the case. And <laughs> well, with all of the things that we're asking of you, you've always responded uh, well to the public, to the employees, and to the, the board. And I really just want to thank you for all of your dedication to VTA. So thank you. And thank you all very much. Director Yeager, I just wanted to thank you for all your leadership through the years. Uh, I think you have the only person to have endured more meetings than Cindy and I. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I want to thank you particularly for your kindness and your mentorship. I can remember very well as a brand new council member uh, a dozen years ago, uh, you were the first to reach out and offer advice and, and uh, help me get up and running. And I know you've been that, that mentor for others as well. So thank you for all your kindness. All right. Uh, I have one member of the public who'd like to speak, uh, Adina Levin. Adina? Oh, there you are. Come on up. Okay. Sorry, uh, Caltrain's a little late, Adina Levin. Friends of Caltrain just wanted to uh, thank uh, Director Yeager for the work, um, particularly um, with regard to addressing Caltrain's uh, financial crisis and, and budget issues that set things on the pace that led till now where um, uh, electrification is underway, um, ridership has been growing since then, and if service had been drastically cut back in the financial crisis where you really step up, um, you know, things wouldn't have been where they are now on a track for long-term success and ridership growth and getting car drivers off the road. So thank you for that and all of the other aspects of the service uh, to transportation and the county. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, another card? All right. Okay. Uh, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, Blair, is this, this is on public comment, though. This isn't on uh, Director Yeager, I assume. This is just, okay, I'll call you up right in just a moment. We're going to go to public comment. Okay. All right. Um, then uh, we will move on to public comment at this time. I encourage those with customer service concerns to contact our customer service department. All the information is there on the screen, uh, email and phone numbers. Um, and uh, we'll ask folks to come forward as I call them. Uh, Roland Lebrun, followed by John Courtney, uh, Terry, I think it's Russell, if I had misread. Uh, 
Forgive me, Chair, if I misstated your name. You should be a doctor. I can't read your writing. Uh, and uh, Nar Navdeep Kaur. Thank you. So um, I'd like to talk about the platforms that the Discovery Museum and then the extension to Warm Springs. I stepped off the light rail last Saturday in heavy rain, and that platform is, is worse than a skating rain. I nearly hit the deck, then right in front of me, a little boy did hit the deck. And that nearly made me hit the deck again. And the only reason the little boy didn't go all the way down is because he was holding his mommy's hand. And I think the reason mommy didn't fall down is the reason mommy had the stiletto heels. Uh, but anyway, enough said, this is extremely dangerous. It has to be addressed, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person that's complained about this. Uh, with regards to the warm strings uh, extension, I'm personally extremely happy with it. And frankly, off-peak, Caltrain doesn't even show up on, on, a, on a Google anymore. It's just Tony me San Francisco. Just take Bart, go to Warm Springs. But the issue is that the 180 sh should never have been, uh, should have been retired when the Warm Springs extension, um, you know, happened. And the reason for that is, is that AC Transit are providing a much better service than the BTA. So people take the 217. There's no reason to continue with the 180. Uh, but on the 181, the absolute opposite is true. I don't know what happened there, but in the morning, there's absolutely no way that the 181 can take the amount of people who are getting off BART and trying to get to downtown San Jose. My guess is that there's students going to San Jose State. So my suggestion is to take these 180 buses, which are not doing anything, and, and stack them behind the 181. And as long as you've got people there standing there and basically who can't get on the buses, just run on the bus right, you know, after the one that you stake off and forget about the timetable and then take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBron. Uh, Mr. Courtney? Uh, the other one, we, that's a oh. trick mic. Yeah. That's right here? <laughs> yeah. That, All right, here we go. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, I promise I'll behave <laughs> this time. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to talk about the negotiations. Um, honestly, we started on, on August 20th is when we began. We've made very little progress. VTA didn't bring a wage package um, until about two weeks ago. So that's a problem when you start August 20th and we're almost into Christmas. So we, uh, it's been very, going very, very slow, and we kind of think that um, the reason it's going slow is they hired a contractor to negotiate, you know, Robert Escobar. I told you I'd give you a shout out. And he has no interest in getting this thing done anytime soon. So that's, to us, that's the problem. Um, and we just, you know, our, our main interest is to bring our members a contract. <clears throat> you know, these folks go to sleep every night after a hard day's work for, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And after a hard day's work, they don't know if they're going to have a contract the next day. That's no way to live your life. We want to get this thing done, sealed up and delivered, so we have three years of labor peace, nothing to worry about. It's not happening. So I'm inviting the board members to meet with the leadership team. Anytime, open invitation. Mr. Mayor, I have your card. I promise you a phone call. And um, Ms. Chavez, thank you for you know, being there for us. But we need to ramp it up a little bit. We want to get this thing done. Um, I don't know if you guys know it, but we have some members of our union and members of your company who are homeless. That's how hurting we are. How does that make you feel when you have employees who don't have a place to live, living out of their cars, in campers, in the yard, can't live here? That's what we're fighting for. That's all we're trying to do is get a fair wage yeah. so we can have a nice place to live and raise our families. We all want to be the part of this community, but we're not able to do that. We don't make enough. So th think about that. Have Thank a good you, night. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, Mr. Russell. After Mr. Russell is uh, Nadeep Kaur, followed by Tammy Denota. Uh, <coughs> Oh, well, my name is uh, Dr. Terry Lepo Russell. <laughs> sir, sir. 
Walter, could you go to the other microphone? I'm the president and business. Mr. Russell, Russell, could I ask you to go to the other mic? There you go. Where is it at? There. <laughs> it's, it's hidden. You're, you're fine. Anyway, you stay where you are. Um, as I was saying, Dr. Uh, Terry Lee Russell, president and business agent of Local 265. And I'm surprised that you don't, couldn't make out my handwriting, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but piggyback on what Mr. Courtney was stating, as the face of this agency is Local 265. We are the ones that keep your buses on the street, your trains on the tracks. Just recently, my overhead lineman has gave you a, a uh, 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 apprenticeship that we took on ownership of. So now within your organization, you don't have to worry about going out hiring or competing with PG&E. You can do it yourself. That was ATU, Local 265. We did that. And, and as John was saying, you know, some, I, I've been here 31 years, and I've seen the ups and the downs. And at some point, ATU has always been there for you to fall back on. We feel like now is our turn to get compensated, show a little gratitude, and say thank you for the hard work that we do. We're the face of this county. We move this county. Yeah. Right? So, hopefully in the next near future here, you're going to get, you'll receive, you're going to receive a, a tentative agreement, only one that I'm Thank you. confident that I'll be able to ratify with sure. my, I know you want me to hurry up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know. And, and I, Thank I you, just Mr. Russell. Like as a president of this local, I at least can have what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Cower? <laughs> Everyone has two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Hania Dworshak and I have been working at BTA for 19 and a half years and six days to be exact. Uh, this is the fourth time that I'm on the negotiation team uh, with uh, SCIU Local 521. I'm the vice chairperson uh, at the local, for the SCIU Local 521 at BTA. Um, to be honest, I haven't even uh, written my what I wanted to speak to you about, but I just want to let you know that we have been at the table for quite some time. Um, I do respect everyone, the management and everyone on um, both on the table, but I do not see movement. Um, the majority of people at VTA have gotten their raises this summer um, and maybe earlier. And even though they did not have to sit there and practically beg for it for uh, weeks and weeks, uh, we certainly do have jobs. Uh, your management team, this is their job, but we have our day job. Uh, I'm a technical project manager, and uh, I'm juggling both being on the negotiation team and negotiating. Um, after months and months, coming back with, with 1.5, I think that's just either a game that we're playing or it's a joke. So I really think... <laughs> I, I really think that we need to be professional and we need to move along much faster than this. Christmas is around the corner and we're working harder than we have in ever. And as I said, we do have our day jobs. So I would ask the board of directors to um, maybe direct your management that we get serious and we wrap this up hopefully tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome.
evening, Tammy. Good evening. My name is Tammy Genota. I've been in VTA for 23 years because I started when I was 12. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm here on behalf of the members of SEIU Local 521, and I'm here to also support um, all of our members as well as ATU. We are the two unions that are in. We're the two unions that are in contract negotiations, and what Hanyet said is exactly true. We're the people that didn't get a raise this year. Um, uh, our members are valued members of our community. They work hard to provide for their families. Just like you guys know, you represent hardworking families in this community. That's who they are. Um, and you also have the, the responsibility to ensure that they get fair wages. We don't want to have more people becoming homeless. And some of our workers make uh, under $50,000 a year, and they could potentially be in those homeless encampments. And that's serious to us. It's not a joke. Um, it's not fair to ask working people to bear the burdens of low wages here at VTA because that's your responsibility while our general manager um, takes home $400,000 a year. And tonight, <laughs> and tonight on the agenda is Nuria's raise. She got a raise last year in December. We, none of us here have gotten a raise for 2018 and she's here tonight on the agenda 9.4 asking for another raise. I think that's insulting. <laughs> There's no equity in that. In addition, VTA continues to show preference to consultants and contractors. Um, our members in the CAM department say that all they have to do is ask for their annual um, cost of living increase, and that's pretty much a guaranteed thing. They get the cost of living increase, 4.5%. Um, that doesn't happen for us. We have to negotiate a contract three years out and hope that you guys are going to be fair. So somehow to us, we're not being treated the same um, when consultants are never denied that cost of living increase, but we are. We're given a 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, .5, and we're supposed to take that serious. That's kind of hard to do. Um, we feel like when you treat us that way, you're just pushing us further into poverty, and it's a pay cut. Um, it's not fair. All we're asking for you to do is negotiate a fair wage just like you do with Nuria. Thank you. Blair Beekman, Mr. Beekman. If anyone would like to speak, please submit a card. That is the way to speak. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I wanted to uh, try to mention the ideas. Uh, you know, I guess I guess this is a, a, a public comment time. That, uh, I've mentioned it a few times uh, over the months now that uh, L.A. is going to be getting uh, a lot, a lot of money. And I, I suppose many cities in California are a lot, a lot of transit dollars. And um, I guess that is how kind of a Republican administration's work is they dump tons of money into uh, cities uh, programs at certain times, and this is one of those times. And um, I, it's my hope you know, that, that as the VTA, you know, you're starting programs of working uh, with communities themselves and with, say, uh, downtown commerce associations and, uh, you know, city commerce and, 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 and city community businesses, small businesses. And you'll be doing some of that work in L.A. a lot, I suppose, uh, at this time. And I just, I really hope that you can just watch your dollars and, and and not go for the free-for-all and the greed that, that happens when dollars you know, appear in our lives. And uh, I'm afraid you know, there'll, there'll be just these grandiose technology ideas and we'll just kind of get lost in that. I know the city of Oakland has been developing really good partnerships uh, with, the, with their business leaders, their small business leaders, and they've been doing some good transit work that I think would be of interest to you that's not quite as glamorous as LA, but could be very practical and uh, good learning lessons. So I think that's about all for now today. Um, yeah, I've said enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we'll move on to item uh, five, which are committee reports. Uh, Chairperson Wadler is unable to join us tonight. He's the chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee. So the report for item 5.1 is in your reading folder. Uh, our pack. Committee Chair Howard Miller is here, I'm told. There he is. And he'll provide a report for item 5.2. Hi, Howard. Good to see you guys. Just for the record, this is my last report as your Chair of the Policy Advisory Committee. 
In the last nine years, I've served in that role three times, and I refused to serve for a fourth. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> it took me a little while to catch on. That's some sort of local record, I think. Okay, there were, there were two items for which we had a lot of discussion that you will be dealing with tonight. Uh, one is the station access policy. Uh, we were very happy with the policy. There were a few comments that we'd like to call your attention to. Um, first, transportation modes are sort of in flux right now. Uh, while you did mention shuttles specifically in the policy, um, autonomous vehicles are, are going on. You did mention um, sort of single occupancy or, or, or normal vehicles. Um, I think that you're going to want to keep track of this one very carefully because transportation modes are going to change radically in the next five years. And I think that this policy is probably going to have to evolve. That was the view. We had a full vote and full discussion on that. The other one was the uh, land use policy. There was one area of contention, and that was whether the policy banned at grade crossings for light rail. We understand that they are not desirable. There was a concern by at least one city that we don't have an outright ban, that that, that could still be considered if somehow there was a project or a situation where that was appropriate. There was a formal motion, and that vote did fail by one vote, um, and that was really while there was a lot of robust discussion, that was the only area of contention on the land use policy. We did approve it, and I think that every member there, even those that voted in favor, uh, understood why an at-grade crossing for light rail is a bad idea, both for safety and for efficiency, but I just figured I'd better bring it to your attention, and that's all I have to report. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Any questions for Howard? All right, thank you for your many years of service as well. All right, uh, we'll move on then to uh, item 5.3, uh, reports from the standing committee chairs. Uh, First board member Camus will report on the meeting of the congestion management program and planning committee. Okay, <laughs> glad I figured this out. Uh, we, we, we discussed the items that are uh, on tonight's regular agenda. Item number 7.1, the station access policy. Item number 7.2, the VTA land use and development review policy. And item number 7.3, VTA joint development transit oriented development parking uh, policy. We also discussed items that are on the consent agenda. Item 6.8, uh, verbs, uh, cy uh, cycle three supplemental uh, program for projects. And the item 6.9, BART Silicon Valley Phase 2, final uh, relocation plan. We received presentations on item 6.11 on tonight's agenda, the North San Jose uh, Deficiency Plan, as well as item 6.10, the SR87 <coughs> Technology Quarter Study Report. I have a, I have a, a request that's going to be that heard on the um, later on item 8.3, and I have a memo for all of you in your packets on item 6.1, but I won't be removing it from consent. Uh, that's the end of my report, Chair. All right, thank you. Any questions for Board Member Camus? Now we'll go on to Board Member Chavez, who will report on meeting of safety, security, transit planning, and operations. Thank you. Uh, a bulk of that meeting was really spent um, uh, discussing the station po access policy, the VTA land use and development review policy, the VTA joint development transit oriented development parking policy. And we also received a presentation from the Caltrain staff on their business plan. And we received port reports on stadium events, ridership, safety, and security programming. Thank you for the brevity of that report. <laughs> okay. Uh, unless there are questions, we'll go on to Board Member Carr, report on meeting of Capital Program Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, you'll recall we established the Capital Program Committee for three primary purposes. Uh, one, to elevate the focus on VTA's capital programs. Two, to elevate board understanding of capital investment needs and challenges. And finally, to provide board level policy, stewardship, and strategic direction for the capital program. The committee has met twice now, and we're still um, understanding those three items and getting into, into depth on uh, all three of those items. At our last meeting on November 30th, we focused on the current capital budget development process so we can understand a little bit more about how we put our capital budget together. 
uh, VTA planning activities and how they are funded, the, the multitude of, no, uh, of sources that we use for funding our capital program, and then the continued development of the enhanced capital program, including a strategic capital plan. Uh, as we move forward, we're going to continue to using those as our foundation to plan, ac uh, we've asked staff to plan activities uh, in our presentations um, uh, or, or the activities that we have seen uh, uh, should be included for new board member orientations. Um, we've asked that uh, we look at simpler, more visual, and more easily, easily understandable financial presentations so that when we look at all of the different sources um, that uh, go into capital, we can really understand where they're coming from and how we're using them. Um, we also uh, provided one referral to the administration at our last meeting. Uh, at um, the, the request of board members Chavez and Perales, we um, asked the administration to uh, study a business interruption fund for uh, BART phase two. Um, this would be an expert third party study of a business interruption fund for BART phase two to provide information, comparatives, and best practices on a business interruption fund. Uh, and we asked staff to provide us a status report at the process of that study at our January board meeting. Uh, we'll meet um, again in, uh, in February as well, and um, at that time we'll be considering the capital budgets for fiscal years 20 and 21. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Director Carr. I, I know there may be some issues with scheduling on that January meeting, but we can perhaps take that offline. Great. Uh, finally, the Governance and Audit Committee met, to, met today. We received the audit status report as well as the status of implementation of corrective actions for inventory management and costing. Um, on to item uh, 5.4, uh, the Eastridge to BART Regional Connector Policy Advisory Board report is in your binders. Um, and on 5.5, uh, the Ad Hoc Financial Stability Committee Chair Jean Bruins will provide a report. I want to thank her for her leadership and hard work on this as well as uh, the work of uh, Director Camus and Director Chavez and all of the stakeholders who came together. Uh, we know this was a very difficult uh, endeavor and, and we appreciate everyone's hard work. Uh, Director Bruins. Okay, I'm gonna start with putting the report out from the last committee meeting. The Ad Hoc Financial Stability Committee met on November 16th. Staff provided the committee with an update on the November 6th election results and the status of the 2016 Measure B litigation. Representatives from Harvey M. Rose Associates presented information regarding their independent assessment of VTA's financial condition, and that um, assessment was commissioned by ATU Local 265. As the final item on the agenda, staff provided a presentation on mitigation measure options to address VTA's structural deficit. And following stakeholder and committee member discussions, the committee unanimously approved a slate of recommendations that encompasses not only specific mitigation measures, but also addresses additional uh, subject matter related to VTA's long-term financial stability that was discussed over the course of the committee's meetings. So with that, I would like um, Chair to move on to item 5.5X. Yes, we'll do so. Um, in June of that, what I'd like to remind the board is in June of 2017, the board approved biannual budget with a transit fund operating budget deficit of 20 million in FY18 and 26 million in FY19. That deficit really revolves around these two components. First, revenues and expenses. Expenses have grown faster than revenues, and sales tax <clears throat> sales tax growth has slowed. I remind everyone that the primary so source of funding is sales tax. And um, while it has shown growth over the prior year's receipts, the rate of growth itself has slowed. And of course, we will be um, hit strong if there is a change in the economic conditions. The second component deals around state of good repair. There is no dedicated local revenue source for the capital expenditures required to keep our equipment in a state of good repair. And that means that we have to tap into the same sources as the operating budget. That need is approximately 30 to $35 million per year. So previously, 
um, we funded from surpluses and from capital reserves, and those are no longer an option going forward. Um, I would also remind the board that the budget was approved with the condition that its projections can, if that, uh, if its projections continue to show a, substan a substantial negative gap in revenues, that the general manager would return to the board with a list of options that would enable BTA to operate in a fiscally sustainable manner. Next slide, please. And that takes us basically to January of 2018, I'm sorry, 2018, when um, Chair Licardo set as a goal for, um, for us is to look at how to tackle or begin the process of attack, uh, tackling the financial stability issue that we have. So Mayor Licardo in January asked that an ad hoc committee be formed. Um, in February of 2018, we actually formed that. The committee it consisted of three voting members, my colleagues, Director Chavez and Director Camus and myself, plus a group of stakeholders, each having a representative on this committee. We met between the months of March and November, and during those meetings, we spent time understanding the current situation, receiving information on items such as revenue and expense, expense drivers, the imbalances we had. We talked about capital programs, workforce productivity, peer agency comparisons, and so on. In June, we utilized a workshop format to try to identify potential strategies and solutions. Much of what we're going to cover um, in terms of our set of recommendations came out of and were a re direct result of some of this workshop activity that we had. After our August meeting, we did, as I reported last time, we did suspend our meetings until after the November election. I think it's important to point out the reason we did so was because we needed to understand the results of Proposition 6 on the ballot. Because of that, definitely was a game changer for us, um, potentially good, potentially bad. So in November, on November 16th, we proceeded. And today, I am going to um, review the committee's recommendations. In doing so, I want to introduce to you three categories because our list of recommendations fall in. We've put them into three different categories. The first is called specific actions, and these are actions that can be done in relatively short order and are able to provide immediate impact. So again, think of these as the short-term items that we can move forward on. The second category is encouragement and policy discussion. These are actions for further review and discussion, and, I encourage, and they encourage the board to both um, have us continue existing efforts and to initiate um, appropriate policy discussions. These are items that are, can be shorthanded into the mid to longer term type of items. The third were items called, that we called further examination. And these items, um, as this title implies, does require further study by staff. They were ideas that were kicked about. However, not enough information, not enough probing has been done. So it's worthy of some additional staff study to look at whether or not there's opportunities for impact in these items. So with that, I'm going to walk through the specific recommendations in each of these three. So again, specific actions, these are more of the short-term items. First is service delivery. We want to implement the next network concepts to the greatest extent possible within the current service hours of one um, of 1.52 million hours of bus and 156k hours of light rail service. This is this um, this is going to require us to basically have staff do some tuning of the next network. If you recall, we had approved an 8713. Um, ratio of ridership to coverage. This is basically saying we need to go to a 90-10. My expectation, and I think my colleagues and all of my stakeholders, is that as staff goes in and tunes this, if, uh, should we approve this, um, that staff will go in and tune that, and then any adjustments that need to be made to services would be um, handled through the normal channels. 
so further on this one, again, if you look at the staff report, you saw the number of hours of service we had in FY18 by the actuals. The budget for 19 had us making a jump in service hours, and what we're saying now is we want to hold those service hours constant. The second item is the, um, is the concept of indexing certain fares to inflation. As we looked at this item, um, we're not suggesting that we do across the board um, inflation, um, but instead on an annual basis through an annual review, the premise is you assume we're going to do um, index the fares upward, but the staff is actually bringing to the board and making us have a conscious decision as to where we're going to make those increases each year. This is to break the cycle of waiting like a lot of transit agencies do in terms of looking at this every five to 10 years. Um, instead, it puts us on a more natural cycle and it actually provides some more predictability. The third one is offering voluntary early retirement to eligible employees and to restructure departments where appropriate. This is not a program that is across the board open to all employees, but we're asking that it be focused in where it makes sense to do so. Um, those three items, and I will, I will get to the cost contribution that we'll have on that one, um, all do have monetary value to them. The fourth and fifth, I wanna explain a little bit. As we were going through our process and we're looking at structural deficit, we can only look at that as it pertains to how we currently operate and what our business is as it's defined today. This item here says we need to conduct a board workshop in 2019. That's what we're asking the board to commit to. And that is an opportunity for us to look at the future of public transportation and really having a good robust discussion in terms of what the landscape looks like, what are the outside forces, what are the things that are causing, um, dis causing disruption, and basically what would be the future business plan for BTA. Some of our discussions and, and our stakeholders who were present in all of this are challenging us to embark on potentially a business plan process similar to what Caltrain is doing. Thinking about out of the box and taking a think tank approach to this and the complimentary item is the last bullet on here is as a result of the workshop, we are looking to not just have, I'm gonna, uh, my choice of words, sorry, not just a dog and pony show workshop, but to come out of there with some specific thoughts about maybe whether we form a committee or a set of committees to look at some of the ideas and such that come out of this workshop so we can then start looking at how do we set ourselves up in the future context, not in terms of just present time, um, because that landscape is changing. Next slide, please. So now taking a look at encouragement and policy discussion items. Um, these were the items that um, we are presenting to you. Um, protecting the services in South County um, if we're into redesigning the next um, network. So this one actually is, even though I have it on this slide, is complementary to the very first bullet on the previous slide. So as we look at maintaining our service hours and such, we are asking um, the board that when we have further discussions on what tuning needs to, might need to be done, that this board um, give uh, careful consideration in terms of whether or not we are further impacting South County, which did take a large hit with the next network. Um, second is the framework. We talked about the framework for funding strategy decisions on ballot measures. I think that needs a translator. Um, as we look for, if, if we ever move forward with another sales tax measure type of thing, we really need to be thinking more holistically and not just targeting dollars for capital, but also trying to bake into some of this, how do we maintain the ongoing operational cost once the capital investment is made, looking at maintenance, and state of good repair, et cetera. So looking at it more holistically rather than just the next um, investment. 
third says revisit capital expansion programs and options for service provision this is something that has been mentioned from the day asked before but when we're looking at the capital projects and particularly I will try to describe this as if we think about what we did with measure a many years ago now we took a VTA took an approach of talking about specific projects but not talking about what the objectives were but is baked into some of our legislation in that ballot measure were specific solutions when you look at a ballot measure that has a 30-year shelf life your crystal ball either had to be really good or things changed and so what we're saying here is that let's look at these capital projects and I think staff is already looking at some of them today but also with an eye as we're going forward and saying what what is this what is the service level we're trying to provision and then what is the best me the best investment to deliver that okay so as we all know the cost of our bus service the cost per hour is different than what it is for light rail and so what makes sense again holistically it's the complement to the first one this the one right above that we also talked about we need to be carefully examining our our funding of partner agreements a lot of what we do today is we are it's we're all in this together as a as a multiple counties and such and we do fund services such as with a such as Caltrain etc we said that we probably need to look at those and scrutinize those a little bit better no specific actions or ideas here but trying to look at what makes sense I don't think we're unique in this as when you have transit agencies funding other transit agencies it is a you know Robin Peter to pay Paul and it doesn't necessarily lift all of us up and so we need to look carefully at those we specifically call out in the next item the future Caltrain funding we call this one out specifically because in 2020 the expectation is that Caltrain board will move forward with an eight cent sales tax measure as we do that all partner funding partners and specifically with BTA we're asking the VTA to look very carefully in terms of what does that mean and how does that alter our funding and all the partner funding that goes to Caltrain next is the encouraging of job housing balance and developments near existing services and that is in our capacity is looking at various projects coming before us and trying to make sure we're getting what we need out of those as well and how those impact our services and the last one is aggressively pursuing joint development opportunities in in doing this one of our stakeholders I will I will use part of the description that that they described to me is what we're looking for here is when when staff brings back any joint development opportunities etc what we don't want or baby back up what we're really looking at is how can we get a plan brought that will allow us to scale up the program okay in terms of in thinking again out of the box looking at things in terms of you know how do we accelerate this this joint development activity what happens if you have you know other sources of money applied to it what if you had different legislation and given the November election with the BART bill sorry before that the BART bill where the legislation was put in place maybe we need to have a VTA equivalent to BART bill those were some of the ideas again around the opportunity in terms of aggressively pursuing joint development next slide and so in that final category of further examinations again not enough discussion necessarily on all of these in depth but examining VTA's funding basis including what funds what is fungible and making sure that we still ensure capital funds are not shifted to operations but trying to understand what we can do and what flexibility we have there with funds identify additional funding sources and with this one we're talking about looking beyond sales tax but trying to really look more broadly looking across the nation as well as looking across agencies in California what are other agencies doing what tools do they have and again being willing to say are there other 
funding um, opportunities that may require some heavy lifting, such as legislation again. Um, we want to conduct comparative study to identify opportunities for contracting in and out. There's um, called to question in this one is whether or not we, sometimes we get, let me see, sometimes we kind of get into a routine, a rhythm, right? And we have some things where we use a lot of outsourced resources and some we do in-house. This is just saying, you know, maybe it's time to relook at that, do a comparative analysis. Are we making the right choices in terms of what we're doing with our labor in-house versus what we're contracting out? Next one is review the billing of staff um, time to capital projects. Um, this particular one, I think, would lend itself for GNA as they look at, you know, the um, Auditor General, whether or not we want to take a closer look. And again, making sure, because um, we, again, we were focused in on the general fund, um, and so making sure that all the accounting is being done and that we're not um, leaving anything behind. Um, and last but not least is update and refine joint development targets and seeing whether, again, if there's more opportunities for us to do something there. So those basically are um, the whole set of recommendations that we're putting forward to the board. And of course, the big question is, and what the heck does this do in terms of addressing a deficit reduction? So we started off with this committee being charged with trying to find 50 to $60 million. And where we ended up is um, thankful to the defeat of Proposition 6. That returns 23 to $27 million plus um, the legislation, the, the um, lawsuit that um, allows us now to go and capture sales tax in terms of online purchases. So with those two items, we're talking around roughly $25 million. Then with the pr presentation I just did, the first um, set of, of actions, um, we will get from the service delivery by holding our service hours as prescribed that means 14.7 million that is saved, um, that basically was budgeted for, and now we're saying we're not going to budget for that. Um, the indexing of fares, looking at that, that potentially brings $2 million. The voluntary retirement brings approximately $1 million. So at this point in time, the only thing that I have not covered is where does the final $7 million come from? And so the the final seven million comes from cost savings and operating efficiencies that are really workforce related actions. For example, having manage the management team actively managing vacancies, consolidation of duties and or positions, where does that make sense for us? And looking at things such as equitable employee contributions toward benefits across all employee groups. So those items in there, um, and we again did not call out any specifics that we're putting on the table. Um, some of it is what staff is already doing um, as they look at you know filling vacancies, et cetera. Um, and we believe that there is approximately $7 million that can be potentially um, found in that arena, which would take us down to our target of zero, okay? So sorry, Sam, I'm not leaving you with, you know, extras, <laughs> but we're trying to get down to that. So um, before I take any questions, I would like to conclude um, by thanking um, a number of people. Um, first, I wanna thank my cohorts and my fellow committee members, Director Cindy Chavez and Director Johnny Camus. Um, I really appreciate the time um, and the wisdom that you brought to this. Um, and I think the three of us, this is a unanimous recommendation here. But I also want to express my deep appreciation to the stakeholder group representatives. Um, they really worked hard. They dedicated a great deal of time, contributed greatly to the conversation that we had, um, and they did an outstanding job. So I'd like to thank them. And Sam, I'm hoping, oh, I'm sorry. Chair Licardo. Sam works too. It's all good. <laughs> I'm hoping that um, that you are um, comfortable with the results that we have. And again, I remind everybody, I think we really do need to put a lot of energy into what is 
what is the future of public transportation so that we can, instead of chasing something, we can get ahead of something. So with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, Director, and really appreciate all of your hard work on this. As I mentioned, all the, the committee members and all the stakeholders, uh, we know this, these are not easy conversations, and they're conversations uh, that are, they're not over, but certainly this is a very important start for us to be able to uh, steady the ship. So thank you, everyone, who's been a part of this, and thank you, staff, for all your support as well. Um, we have several members of the community who'd like to speak, and then we'll come back to the, the board for questions. Uh, ASIN NDI followed by uh, Dean Levin and Eugene Bradley. Uh, Mr. Bradley, since you're right there, come on up. We can hear you first. I'm going to make this real fast. Eugene Bradley, Silicon Valley Transit Users. I know that it's been a while since I've had to take care of my ailing mother who had a stroke in the new, on New Year's Day. So I'll just make this brief and short. Thank you for visiting us, Sam, back in April. We'll get to you in a separate letter. Anyway. Several of the concerns with this ad hoc financial stability plan is that in terms of buses, we seem to be going backwards. I understand that the proposed plan eliminates a lot of buses, bus service in Los Gatos, South San Jose, as well as in some areas of the South County. When voters approve all these measures, especially Measure V, they were hoping for increases in bus service. Now we're seeing the exact opposite yet again. With Google coming into downtown San Jose especially, Here's the state and secret that Seattle increased its transit ridership. They invested in buses, not so much trains, buses. Just a couple of ideas in addition that VTA staff should pursue. For instance, reconsider having BART run down from downtown San Jose to Santa Clara. It's already duplicating something that's been there since 1858, in particular Caltrain, Amtrak, and now ACE, as well as the VTA's 2025-22. Also, reconsider building extra lanes along, say, Lawrence Expressway. I've never read in any of these reports about VTA highway construction where the highways that are constructed actually relieve gridlock. See the extension, see actually the interchange at 101.85 in Mountain View, already declared obsolete back in 2004 by Gary Richards. Anyway, it's time VTA really rethinks some of these projects, and you shouldn't just take it on the very rider transit ridership you're trying to grow. You really want to be ahead. Grow something called buses. They've been there since the 40s. Grow them. It's not hard. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mason. Hi, Ace and NZI with Working Partnerships. Um, first, I want to thank the uh, committee chair folks. Um, that's uh, uh, board member Chavez, board member Camus, and uh, board member Pruins. I really appreciated their participation as well as other stakeholders uh, during the committee. Um, first, I just want to say again, um, when this first started, I, I had a lot of hope for the process because I thought we were really going to start tackling a lot of the uh, tougher issues around land use, around service quality, and around funding. And I think we were able to at least like get started on a few of these. But I think there are still opportunities to enhance and strengthen those recommendations. Um, specifically, uh, thinking about the fact that hopefully in the future there'll be uh, more opportunities for funding and having a plan, a long-term, uh, hopefully at least 15-year plan to, to be thinking about how VTA will fund itself, um, to pursue ways to expand VTA's participation in the development process, specifically how VTA can start thinking about um, ways for the EcoPass to be uh, utilized more for residential projects, and then um, last thing, and I'll take a little bit of time to kind of go through this, is how do you use capital uh, funding and capital projects and capital uh, uh, grants in order to help increase service efficiencies? And the way that I uh, try to pitch it is, it's the, similar to getting an oil change, changing the filters, or changing the tires on your car so that you end up spending less money on gas over time. And this is what you can do with capital expenditures, especially, for example, on the downtown transit mall, um, over on the Tasman corridor, or in North First Street, or by bus stop improvements or, or bus lanes, where you end up actually spending less, getting more service for either the same money or for less money because you're in improving uh, the, um, the quality of the service. So thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to you. Uh, after Ms. Levin is uh, Blair Beekman and Roland LeBron. Right. Um, good evening, Adina Levin with Friends of Caltrain. Um, first of all, uh, uh, 
thank you to the work of the uh, committee and the board members for grappling with a financial crisis and how to handle it. Thanks to the good news. Um, thanks for making changes that um, don't have as severe implications, but still keeping the uh, operations close to constant is not keeping up with ridership growth. It's not keeping up with economic growth. And it leaves um, uh, structural issues that I want to make some comments about uh, addressing those structural issues further going forward. Um, first, I want to echo what ASA NDI uh, just said about um, escalating um, uh, capital projects that will improve the amount of service that you get per dollar of taxpayer funding. There already are projects on the books, whether they be signal priority and Q-jump lanes and Alder boarding programs and speeding up light rail. There's a variety of projects that if they are escalated, they will make the transit faster, more competitive, increase ridership, and also get more service per dollar. Um, so please uh, do focus on escalating those. And um, uh, uh, secondly, glad to hear that relooking at capital projects um, is in the queue. Um, there are projects that have been on the books for many decades that may no longer address um, current travel needs, current land use patterns, and current environmental goals. And um, look, right now, VTA is having trouble funding the service it runs and doing new projects that don't achieve those goals will make the hole deeper and deeper as time goes on. So really do encourage um, looking at those projects and um, uh, refreshing to be able to not dig the hole deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brinkman? Hi, I'm new to all of this, so I hope you can be patient and bear with me as I try to describe my feelings that I've been learning, uh, you know, these past few months. Way back in the uh, early, you know, uh, I guess 2010s, uh, you know, the, uh, the fracking boom started, and a few years later, VTA here really went crazy with it. And it took you, it's my understanding, to about 2016 or so that you calmed that uh, thing, <laughs> that greed for it, I guess, whatever comes with that, uh, you know, just glut. And uh, thank you for that. I think you probably learned some good fiscal lessons from that. And I think we're all learning important fiscal lessons that, you know, the idea of fracking, the whole idea of fracking boom in the uh, first Mr. place. Mr. Brinkman, no, we're not talking about fracking. I'm so. talking fracking in terms of uh, not displacement, but what's the issue called uh, that she mentioned that we have to worry about for the future of, of VTA. So I'm, I'm, I'm including this as part of the subject. Okay. Now, now, it's not displacement, but what is the term exactly called? Uh, a, a re disruption. In the terms of disruption that we're all facing right now, and that's going to be a very major issue in uh, 2000, in the mid 2020s, um, that's a, that's part of a whole fracking plan that there won't be the same fracking possibilities in 10 years. So it, you know, fracking is a limited source of, wor of we, work. We're not discussing from that. that from that idea. It. I just wanted to ask. I just wanted to bring up how you're going to develop your future here at the VTA based on balancing, you know, a few different groups at this time. And I hope we can respect that balance between each other, uh, between those groups, and that both sides can be, can be talked about in the future. And the ideas of uh, bicycles are important right now. And um, good luck in your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Thank you. So I think, yes, I am in support of the recommendations by the committee. But what I would like to do is to give you some early input on the refining of the joint development targets. Specifically, I think we had the discussion at the Station Access Committee. We should not be turning parking at end of line stations into um, uh, TOJD. I'll give you an example, Tamian. Um, 
the ridership is dropping right now. The reason the ridership is dropping is because there's a mud bath over there and people are just driving to work because there's no way for they, and them to park at Tamian anymore. So if you build apartments, you can have the, the same uh, uh, result. And the solution is make Tamian no longer a land of lion station. And when you do that, the problem will basically take care of itself because people won't have to drive there anymore because they'll be going to Blossom Hill or a lot of them will actually be building trains in Morgan Hill and Gilroy instead of hitting 101. Um, and the elephant in the house is in Deridon. I absolutely do not want the VTA to have anything to do with TOJD at Deridon. And actually, my recommendation at the Catherine board this morning is to direct the board to immediately enter into exclusive negotiation agreements with Google for all the Caltrain parking parcels. And I, tr I absolutely 100% trust Google to come up with a solution that's gonna address not just the parking, but also housing right there, all integrated, all in one piece. We cannot afford to have two different houses house in the central zone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, looks all the members of the community came out to speak. Uh, we're back uh, to the board's discussion. If we could go back to the slide that describes the math. Uh, I appreciate uh, that these are it's very difficult finding solutions uh, for large structural deficits is the one we have. The good news is uh, the voters helped us uh, find part of the solution and uh, I guess a court case helped us with another. So uh, that does give us some, some help. Uh, but I, as I understand it, in the worst case scenario, it could be even more than the 25 million, depending on how we look at the starting target. Uh, we're starting at 60 million, and, I, and so I, I just want to try to be as sober as possible about the fact that we still have a lot of work to do, and that seven million that is sort of the omnibus category for cost savings and operating efficiencies, um, as we all know, that is um, a very broad term that requires a lot of very specific action. <laughs> And I heard one of the specific actions that was mentioned was relating to equitable uh, employee contributions to benefits. And I just wanted to ask you, Director Bruins, does that relate to ensuring that all the employees are contributing uh, the same percentage of their paycheck uh, for, uh, for pensions? Yes, <clears throat> so under that category, one of, one of the examples is employee contributions to pension costs. Um, we believe that that should be equitable across all the employee groups. Okay. Um, well, okay. If I'm going to disagree just for a minute. Oh, maybe. And yeah. only to say this, that one of the, so a couple things that I would say, I, I think, first of all, I just want to acknowledge just the incredible leadership that Jeannie showed in this. Because to be honest with you, like, she, she didn't really, none of us really knew, but you said, Mayor, you sort of say, gave a direction and she charged in a really great way and she just really can't be acknowledged enough. And also um, the staff really, I, I think people tried to put their best ideas forward. I, the, the, the challenge we had, I think, was that because in a good way we were being very transparent and very iterative, there were a number of ideas that came forward and one, and one set of those ideas had to do with employee um, compensation in one form or another. We withdrew talking about that because we were going through negotiations on this side. So I would honestly say we did not, we didn't end up having a conversation where we all agreed about X or Y in part because we're doing that in closed session. Yeah. And I, I wanna devi I wanna just kind of draw a bright line there because I don't, not, not, in a, not in a negative way or anything, but I, I think that the, the solutions we started to focus on while they included some employee um, issues, and, I, and one of them I'm actually very interested in diving in a little deeper to tonight, but, but for the most part, I think as it related to things that would be addressed at the bargaining table, we really wanted to leave that to the board in closed session. And, okay. and, and, and Director Chavez is absolutely correct. Like I said, what I, I, there are different ideas and such, but what we pursue at the labor table is out of the hands, our direct, I mean, the yes. direct hands of this committee, right? Yeah, understood. But there were a number of workforce-related items 
um, another example that, again, not with no specifics in terms of any specific recommendation, but ideas that got kicked around that I believe can be considered in the toolkit per se as we look at some of the workforce stuff. You know, sharing of healthcare cost, um, looking at that, looking at productivity losses, looking at what um, the general manager has already done in terms of like the deferring of wage increases, the, again, filling of vacancies. There's a whole list of things and any combination could take place or not take place. Um, so, but with labor negotiations, it's not appropriate, we do not feel it was appropriate to come with any specific narrowly defined set. Okay, and I appreciate uh, you know, the, the tightrope I think that we're all on. I, I, I just want to offer the observation, I, you know, these are again very hard, it's a hard task. Um, and for the most part, our solutions fit in um, just a very small number of buckets. Either we cut service, and we know much of that service is for transit-dependent residents in our communities, and that's a very hard choice. Uh, we increase fares, again, on people with very limited incomes, um, or we cut costs, uh, assuming there's no windfall of new revenue. Obviously, there have been two very big sources of new revenue, uh, or at least reassurances with regard to revenue on sales tax and SB1, but uh, we know at least until uh, the next opportunity to get before the voters, there's really not new revenue. And it seems to me as long as we're in a situation where all employees are not um, contributing the same amount uh, to their pensions, I think that is a situation that is not fair to some employees and frankly, getting to $7 million in savings or what may be more than $7 million, it's going to be awfully difficult to get there unless we really have equitable contribution. And so uh, I just wanted to offer my two cents. I appreciate the recommendations, and, and obviously we're all doing our best to make sure that uh, the negotiations that have to stay at the table stay at the table. Okay, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Director Kamis. Um, I actually also agree with you wholeheartedly, uh, Mayor, uh, but um, – we were advised, and, and I think we went down the route that we didn't want to discuss um, things that have to be negotiated with the union. But clearly, we left it on there as a potential option so that so that the board can entertain it. And I think that's that's what we're saying. Um, and, and I support you on that. Partnerships, um, considering ourselves, right, with with Google coming in to, to San Jose as well, and thinking about their programs that they run in Mountain View. And uh, again, I think if we don't get in front of that, uh, that's what we're also looking at as well. And, and, and then you wonder, yeah, well, do, do we get eaten up then? Does public transportation, you know, in general sort of now become, um, you know, the, not just the second choice, the last choice, or just no choice at all? And so I, I just think that was really profound. That, you know, that, that yeah, this is, uh, and I'll be supporting this as well, I think, um, you know, but looking at it in, in, in that, large context is kind of what it is that we're thinking about. This isn't just a, a budgetary problem for this year or because there's a, you know, because we have a recession that happens. This is something different that, that we haven't experienced before. This is different, a different challenge with, with transportation and public transportation altogether. I did want to bring up a point that Asin and, and Adina had mentioned, which was uh, this concept of uh, the use of capital funds. And I, I, I'm reading this in, the, in here with stating, uh, Exam VTS funding base, including those that are fungible while ensuring capital funds are not shifted to operations. With I obviously completely understand that and, and looking at it in the, 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 the strategies here that are laid out, um, it really only has an in-progress comment though and um, I, what I understand from their public comments was something not shifting the funds but using it in a way which we already have maybe some projects on the, on the books that would that would actually help increase service, and so I, I'm assuming that's within the thought process as well with what's included. I just I, I can't tell from just the in progress under the staff comments on that item. So I'm curious if staff can respond to that. Uh, and if not, if you I'm want not, to note, sure note the I, comment, if I got the question, <laughs> I'll repeat the, the question. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So. Uh, in, it's listed a couple times, but page uh, three of five on the back here of the, the, the spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at that one at the moment. Uh, item 4.1, examine VTA's funding base, including those that are 
fungible while ensuring capital funds are not shifted to operations. Uh, you look over to the right, staff comments just says in progress. Um, and then we heard from two speakers, Asin and Adina, they were talking about the use of capital funds. Um, and and I, I kind of fit it into this category. I don't know if that's where right. it fits, okay. but, but where could we use that in ways, uh, could we be discussing ways on, on how we're prioritizing some of the uses capital dollars that happens to also improve ridership? Um, thank you for, for the clarification. Uh, there are a couple of things. To the extent legally permissible we do use, for example, 2000 measure aid, there is a certain level of 2000 measure aid we can use for our operations, which we do. Second thing, um, the 1976 tax is one of the major sources of revenue for VTA, and uh, to the extent staff could be consultants too, who work on a capital project, their expenses are charged to capital to either 2000 Measure A or to grants where applicable, whether it's state or federal grants. So we do, we do that, you know, some uh, staff, VTA staff who work on capital projects, their time, their salary expense does get charged to capital. I'm sorry, that wasn't the, the direction of it. I, 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 and I'm trying to restate it. If, if needs to, I'll ask maybe Asin to come on up. But I, I, what I heard from Asin and Anita was in regards to using these capital dollars for capital projects whatever legal way, which may include some staff time, but yeah. which capital projects were using it in a way that it were, were using it for ones that, uh, that may increase ridership, where we know these are also increasing the, the, the service and, and looking at those uh, and maybe prioritizing those. And I, I may be misstating it, so actually I'll, if Asian, if you're still here, if you want to just, I'll invite you to come on up to, so that way I don't try to mix your words. Uh, I, I think yeah. I can address this. Oh, um, yes. That actually is, what Asen is referring to is not really part of 4.1, and that okay. might be where the disconnect is. And I didn't know. That's why I was. Right. That's why I saw maybe it fitting, but maybe it's wrong. Right. I, I believe. Well, I won't put yeah. words in his mouth either. I'll let him. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I think maybe the um, uh, the most illustrative example is uh, an item that was before the board. I think two months ago it was the North First Street light rail improvements, um, where they proposed um, cutting off left hand turns, uh, uh, coordinating. Uh, signal prioritization, thinking about uh, better ways to block off people who are currently kind of getting on the tracks during the uh, during the day, and helping to sort of move along those huge time pinch points. Uh, the estimate was that on each day, uh, I'm sorry, full route, they could save about uh, eight minutes uh, per route. Now, those eight minutes, obviously, because light rail has a really high per hour service cost. Overall, we'll save a million dollars by the end of the year. Um, and so just thinking about how are we using the capital uh, expenditures in order to help save money on the operation side. Thank you, Asin. So it doesn't fit under 4.1, then do we, is there a category where we're looking at that, where that's, where that does fit, and maybe I just, I, I'm not seeing it here. I'm not sure that there is one specifically on this list of recommendations. I will say that at least indirectly, that's part of the, um, the, the new capital program committee that that they are working to relook at the criteria with which we select capital projects and it could easily fall under that process okay and maybe I don't know if any of the committee members that were on there if Jeannie if you want to speak to it if that was something that was no. oh, I'm sorry director Clark yeah. Oh, no, I meant, uh, I'm sorry. In, the director Clark. Uh, not in the committee. I'm actually was curious. So I guess that wasn't discussed in, in regards to this ad hoc committee. So I think, you know, I think um, God, there's so much discussion that took place with the ad hoc. So so let me kind of put my own spin on, on, on some of that I think is related. When Asun's talking about and, and what we're hopefully, hopefully this new committee that Larry is in charge of and all, you know, it, being very careful in terms of how we use our capital dollars. And so I'm for the purposes of example, not to say that this is the other than just uh, making something up. OK, if you if we have a choice, let's say, for extending light rail to the Sona, OK, that's a capital project that's quote on the books, right? If you look at that, does it make sense to spend the capital dollars to do that? Or does it make more sense to maybe take existing light rail service? And so now I'm going to pick on another side. And if you look at light rail through San Jose, for example, would our capital dollars be better spent 
trying to speed up the service that we already have, dealing with signal prioritization, dealing with the pedestrian track conflict, you know, hardening that so that the trains can move through there quicker, you know, looking at our use of quiet zones. But do, so our capital dollars better spent, given where we are now, with speeding up and getting more people on the light rail that already exists before you go and take the capital and do an extension because extensions of something that already might be, again, in my particular example, slow, that slow piece prevents people, even if you extend it out, to really say that this is going to compete with my getting in my car, right? So this is kind of looking at those projections, those things that we have out there and what can be done and are we making the investments where we need to, given where we are today? When you say this is looking at it, what are you referring to as this? Part, in terms of what we're kind of some of the stuff that we talked about in the ad hoc. So you did talk about that in the ad hoc. Was to look at things. Okay, but yeah. it's not listed on any of the recommendations for. No, because I think what we tried to do is instead say this is subject area, and now staff needs to be looking at, you know, with that type of a lens. Is there anything we would be doing differently, either that's already on the plate or that will be on the plate activated soon? Can we look at this with a different lens rather than saying, again, my own personal language is, I owe Bob something. I promised it to him 10 years ago. I mm -hmm. have to deliver it to him versus saying, wait a minute, in the context of all of this, is that really, do I really, is that the best use of the dollars to honor a, a commitment I made 10 years ago versus saying, you know what? to deliver a service that makes sense for him, I really need to fix what exists today first and get myself in a better position to extend. But again, that's a hypothetical example without talking about any, I mean, we didn't talk about any specific project. Yeah. We really believe, as Cindy says, we have smart people on staff. They can go and figure this out and look at maybe are there trade-offs, hard decisions that should come to a board and whether or not we have intestinal fortitude up here <coughs> kind of think about this more in a different fashion. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that completely. The, the part that I guess I'm, I wasn't seeing was that it's actually listed as a recommendation. So you're saying you did talk about it. Um, I thought it maybe was found yeah. within a recommendation, apparently M not. Mr. Chair, and with deference to the other chair of our Capital Program Committee, I, I do want to bring uh, your attention back to the PowerPoint presentation that uh, Ms. Bruins uh, shared with us. Uh, the in, under encouragement and policy discussions, I, the third bullet. Can you switch to that slide number? Two? Yeah, there. Yeah. The third bullet talks about revisiting capital expansion programs. So that's that begins to speak to your concerns. But we also have a uh, program that we're working on within our own organization. Uh, it's called the FAST program, and that is a coordination of all of the, our operations and uh, planning, uh, finance, looking at ways that we can improve the service so that we can save dollars. Uh, uh, one just uh, word of caution as we are talking about transferring funds from capital to operations is that we do have a backlog of capital needs and uh, that we need to address because in order for us to continue receiving more funding, we have to be in a state of good repair or better. Mm -hmm. And we're hardly there. So clearly uh, looking at ways that we can improve our existing service by introducing these logical um, improvements, hardening of the system, uh, ex uh, making the, the functionality of our operations much more efficient. Uh, we have an IT working group uh, that is in comprised of all of the traffic engineers from the cities. And um, I was just being briefed by Chris Augustine, our director of planning, on the work that they're doing, looking at signalization throughout the cities that uh, where, where we have uh, light rail service and bus service, because it's, it also affects bus. Thank you for pointing. So, so this is great. So it is listed there. It's not necessarily listed in one of these, you know, bullet points. No. Um, but and that's mainly what I was, what I was trying to ask was it. Obviously, that that recommendation coming in sounds like it. It sounded like from our community members that it wasn't there. No. Um, it, it is there and it was discussed and we yeah. will be discussing that as a both staff uh, and a committee. We so. will. As a matter of fact, it's also um, under the land policy um, 7.2 that we'll be bringing back in January. No? Which item? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 7.2. So Thank you. Oh. 
There we go. Okay. <laughs> so, so it is there. Uh, so, and, and um, I also wanted to see, because I, uh, it, it was, as I said, I, I didn't gather much from some of the comments. When we hear back, it sounds like in February now, um, or at least for at least this, uh, I guess we're going to host a board workshop. Um, I'm just curious when we might see some of these in progress denotations um, with something more detailed. Yeah. Mary, who would, who would like to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> The, yeah, the committee recommended um, that the the issue be viewed through three lenses, and uh, each of those lenses have generated a number of actions. Uh, I believe I heard that uh, rather than having each action being discussed in particular committees, that the full board have the opportunity to comment. But I will now look to um, Jeannie Bruins. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I, I think... Um, I want to go back to what Director Chavez said. You know, I think this is kind of providing a framework for how we can address things. And, and you know, one of her things that she put on her list, if I caught you correctly on this, is the same thing that I, that I want. If we approve this kind of thing, then I, it is a framework, but we should have staff go back and start looking at some of these things. So like bullet number three on here, revisit capital expansion programs and options for service provisioning, et cetera, impact those can come back and they we can have a work plan that shows us what are all the things that staff is looking at the time frame they're looking at these things um, and where we are with some of these so that we can advance some of them so I think we need that work pl plan that's consistent with this kind of a framework that we've put together right. Maria, did you Cindy, did you want to? Yeah. Just one moment. I think Jerry and then we'll go to Steve. Right. So, um, so that we're all clear <laughs> on next steps. Um, I believe that what um, Board Member Chavez had offered was that we go back, as you stated, um, Member Bruins, and develop a work plan. First, develop a process on how we're going to address these findings and reflect that into a work plan so that we will have a very comprehensive approach to one, determining whether um, the items that are being recommended here uh, bring the, the greatest value, if there are other opportunities that we should be considering. Mr. Chavez. Yes, and, and the only, what, I, what I, I think what would be good to have come back to the full board would, would be the work plan, just so everybody can see it. Because the problem with the way it gets divided up, it's just hard for people to understand. You all did a really excellent job of of pointing it out, but it, it, but sharing how it how it converges, what will come, how the board will make those decisions, what the expectations will be, I just think would be helpful. Yeah. So if really what I want to give you is flexibility, and, and let me just make two points about the committee. The reason I actually really like the subcommittee process because it's almost like practicing, right? You get all the bugs out of the discussion, you get a chance to reflect. It allows us, it should allow us um, to have richer discussions here. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but if the if you came back and said you know we're, we're, we want to work on the following things, we're going to test it in committee A and then bring it to the full board. That may make sense in some instances. For other subject matters, it may just need to come to the full board as part of a workshop. But I do want to give your team the chance to frame that up, add meat to the bones. This was sort of done in a tight time frame, with a lot of um, the frankly our fingerprints and Johnny's and and uh, Jeannie's and really trying to capture the. Um, the thoughts of, of a lot of people over a pretty long period of time. So I just want to give you guys another shot at that. Okay. Uh, I have uh, Vice Chair O'Neill and then Director Clark. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, I was able to go to several of the meetings of the committee, and and there were a lot of um, it was you know I think some frank discussions, and I, I think ultimately when it comes down to is that, you know, we've got to create a product that people are going to want to buy. You know, it's kind of like I, having gone through um, things in the private sector where you look at when you're at a point where, where do you, when you, your know, product isn't performing the way you want financially, do you make, is it, when do you make investments or, you know, how do you uh, assess that model and when do you decide that, okay, this isn't something that's going to work. But I don't think we're there yet, but I think we do have to acknowledge that our fair box recovery for whatever reason, says to me that you know we're not creating a product that enough people want to buy, 
And, and one of the other things, I went with um, some of the staff with Nuria to the um, national, uh, the APTA conference in Nashville, and I remember the Jane uh, Williams, the acting director of the FTA, made a comment about you don't want to be the last agency or anybody to adopt a technology that's on the way out, you know, just in, just because somebody made a commitment. So I think, you know, so some of it needs to be, let's look at, you know, what are the needs that people have and, and whether we, maybe the, their needs are met through a different way. And I, I think we should look at how do we honor commitments made to people to provide them with transportation, but it, maybe it's not in the way that we originally thought. Things have changed, but that really hit me when she said, nobody wants to be the last um, system to invest a lot of money in something that's going away. Um, so there were other recommendations that some of the consultants that came in to some of those meetings made, and I think we can drill down on those. So it's got to be a combination of things. I think the things that Mr. NDA was, make, it was suggesting, those are very viable, and along with organizational efficiencies and all of that, you know, because this, it does make me nervous being, you know, that we're so reliant on something that is such a volatile source of funding, such as a sales tax. And I, I don't know that, I, I doubt the, perhaps the willingness of our public to provide more funding until we can find a way to show that we're being the best stewards we are, can be of the funds that we're already getting. Director Carr. Thank you, Mr. I just wanted to comment real, real briefly on the questions, um, Director. Uh, Perales and Director McAllister had asked about the capital program. I, I fully expect the capital program committee to look into the things that you were asking about and, and that you were asking about, Mr. McAllister, both in terms of are we spending monies on capital projects that puts us further into a structural problem, and are we spending monies in a way that actually reduces operating costs? Uh, and that that should be, uh, staff is, uh, our staff team has talked to us a lot about ex an expanded capital um, capital projects plan and how we do a capital budget in an expanded, uh, expanded fashion. And those are some of the things that I want us to explore in asking those kinds of questions. So hopefully that gets to the issues that you're looking for and as well as you, Mr. McAllister. Thank you, Larry. Uh, any other comments? Well, again, uh, thank you. Director Bruins, for all your hard work and leadership, uh, and to avoid any anticipatory mutiny, I, I think we should hereby dissolve the ad hoc committee. Uh, I'm sure to, do <laughs> to the delight of its members. <laughs> and I've also entertained a motion to adopt the, uh, the recommendations. That was part of your motion. Okay, so Director Chemist is so moved. Okay, so, so the motion then includes uh, approval of the recommendations, the work plan, uh, returning to the board with the process, is that what you said, Elaine? With a, with a work plan and a process. And the yeah, process, process, right, right, right. Yes, for Thank addressing you. the findings. I'll second that. And for the dissolution of the uh, beloved No More Ad Hoc Committee. <laughs> okay, uh, Director Chavez. Okay, you just seconded. Okay, good. Any comments? All right, all in favor? <laughs> yes, thank you, Jeannie. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, we move forward. Now we're on the consent agenda, hard to believe, huh? <laughs> I've got some requests to speak, I know, on items 610 and 611, so we'll pull those items along with, I'd like to make Brief comment on item 6-9. Uh, is there a motion on the remainder? Okay. Uh, Sorry, what, what were you So asking, what sir? we're moving, uh, what Director Chavez just moved is item 6.1 through 6.8. Oh. We're going to separately consider we're the other. We're moving those. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. All right. And uh, I don't have any cards on those items. I'm going to recuse myself. Oh, wait, 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 excuse me. Move them or remove them? Move. Oh, I wanted to remove three items. Sorry. Which which items would you like to remove? Six five, six six, six seven. Okay. Those three items are also removed. So the, the motion that remains is items six point one through six point four, and six point eight. Is that is that right, Director Chavez? Okay. All right, on that motion. I've moved on the cards already. The 6.1 one. 
Oh, yes, and uh, I'm recusing myself on item 6.4 of the current motion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, do you wish to speak on these items specifically? Okay, I can assure you there's no fracking in any of these items. So I expect whatever comment it will be, will be specific to that, that item. On the board minutes. Okay, um, yeah, I guess I wanted to apologize. I was trying to build a narrative in my last, uh, and I'm sorry if it uh, went off a little bit for you, sorry. Um, I, I, on this item, you know, hopefully, you know, I don't know, I can't talk about the depth of this issue, but it's talking about traffic congestion issues in North San Jose. And I, if it, it's important to me that- uh, that's, that's a separate item. That's not 6.11? No, that's, uh, that's item 6.11. Uh, uh, this is 6.1. It's 6.11. Yeah, 6.11 is, is the traffic congestion in the North San Jose. Yeah, that's the deficiency plan. And this is just 6.1. We'll call it item shortly. Okay. This is just 6.1? That's right. Sorry. <laughs> Very sorry. All right. Thank you. All right, on the motion, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, I'm told I should go to the regular agenda and then come back, is that right? Okay, here we go. Uh, <coughs> Mr. LeBrun, we'll come back to it. 6.11? Yeah, we'll come back. We got a lot of items to run through here. Um, so 7.1 and 7.3, Jointly, the station access policy and the VTA transit oriented development parking policy. Um, so we're going to hear those two together. I believe we'll have a presentation. Is that right? Take it away, Chris. Uh, it is the prerogative of the board. I do have a short presentation of the if the board uh, the, would like to hear that. We'll go through very quickly. Uh, we'll be receptive to a very brief presentation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I will mention all three of these together, even though we have taken off 7.2 and we'll bring that back later. I will just have a couple of comments about each one. Um, each of these policies has gone through the advisory committee structure and our standing committee structure. Um, so I'll have a brief presentation about each one. I do have the project managers from the, the two items we're considering tonight. Um, Ron Golam, who's the deputy director of real estate and joint development. Iko Cuenco, she is the transportation planner. She is the project manager for the station access policy. So by way of just a little bit of a foundation, um, I wanted to bring attention to the connection and the relationship of these policies. Each of these is founded in our strategic plan that was adopted by the board at the end of 2016. And the strategic plan does provide the guidance to establish these, the foundations for each of these. Each has a role in creating and supporting transit and pedestrian oriented development on and around VTA's core services. Station access policy, it's a high level uh, policy. We have organized this policy in a hierarchy to, uh, of access modes that provides priority access to the modes that are low cost, have the fewest negative impacts on the environment and surrounding neighborhoods and support the tenants of transit oriented development and sustainable communities. I'll also add that by far the greatest um, percentage of, of, of access to transit, to our transit system is by walking. Um, more than 50, more than, more than 75 percent. 80 percent, I'm sorry. So the hierarchy applies to both the trip to and from the station, the final destination, uh, the first and last mile connection on both those ends. At the top of the hierarchy is access for pedestrians followed by bicycle access, connecting to transit, kiss and ride, park and ride access, and accommodations for folks with uh, disabilities are always considered in each one of these hierarchies. And again, um, we've mentioned this in committees just to get some questions, the, each of these um, the access improvements um, will be applied in, to the context based on the land uses surrounding the station. So um, we'll be looking at these on a case-by-case -case basis. I'll skip the land use and development policy and go into a short talk about the TOD parking policy. So parking utilization at our light rail stations has, has overall been consistently low with certain exceptions, of course. Today, daily, we have about 4,000 parking spaces throughout the county that go unused across these sites. This policy is designed to provide a framework for board decision making about how we handle parking for TOD and VTA owned sites and how private developers handle parking and their projects around our stations. The, the overarching strategy is to maximize ridership growth, increase revenues for VTA and optimize parking usage at stations and we'll tailor our approach to specific locations and circumstances depending on the station area. 
We did do an examination of how other properties are approaching this. We looked at how other large properties in California and the U.S. handle TOD, and we've incorporated that into the development of this policy. A key implementation tool um, that we'll develop to support this policy is a VHA parking model, and this model will quantify how different approaches to TOD and station parking would affect ridership revenues and parking utilization. So we'll be able to test various scenarios about how um, parking can be handled at each specific location. Um, and again, the preparation of this model will be informed by our um, peer review analysis we've done with other properties, including BART and other agencies that use a similar tool. So with that, the conclusion side is to, um, to we're asking for approval of the staff recommendations you see on the screen with the exception of 7.2. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation and turn it back to the board. Sorry. Uh, are there any members of the board that wish to make a comment? Uh, Mr. Beekman, did you wish to speak on this item? You pass? Okay. Okay. Member Carr. Thank you. I have a question, if I might, Chris, on, um, I guess it's really on 7.1. In the station access policy, um, your slide, and it's in the, the, the staff report as well, that shows the priority system. Um, I'm, Help me understand how the, as you talked about the case-by-case -case evaluation, how that works when we have an, uh, a policy that outlines a priority like this. I'm, I'm concerned that stations in more rural communities, that, that you know, the, the, the access to stations is really by cars, and, 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 and because of just geographic difficulties, uh, public transportation can't be accessed without driving. How are we going to address those areas when our priority puts parking at the very bottom? Well, I, I think, again, this is on a case-by-case -case basis. So in those circumstances where we know there's high, high utilization of, of parking facilities or potentially high future demand, we certainly take that into account about how we're, we're proposing station access priorities be for a certain location. So does the policy itself, and, and I'm sorry if, I, if I've missed this, does the policy itself talk about that evaluation process, that case-by-case -case evaluation process? It does. Okay. Um, and, and in the section where we talk about monitor, uh, measure and monitoring, um, we, we talked about collecting and analyzing access data. So is that what's going to lead us to? That, that, that will certainly, certainly be part of it, correct. Okay. So, uh, so again, so the communities where stations are, are, are highly accessed by people driving to them because they can't get to them walking-wise, those stations will still have an ability to not worry about parking being the last priority. That's that's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask uh, if you've been thinking a little bit about what to do parking-wise with in this last mile environment with the scooters um, in particular. Yes, we've we've had, we've had a lot of internal discussions about that. Uh, this is a high high level policy, uh, so, so but we do know we're going to need to burrow down into the details of things like that. So we will be looking at as a follow up once this policy is passed to come back with more detailed recommendations about how to handle some of those things. For example, uh, you know how to handle scooters on our platforms, how to handle scooters on our major bus stops, that kind of thing. I, the reason I raise it is that just the on the station access, access policy, since so many people are using those, that really should be even the picture of them right now should be listed <laughs> as, I'm not kidding, because I think it, it, I think it's so prevalent, and I, you know, for a bunch of different reasons, but one of the reasons I'm really mindful of it is the more popular places get and the less structured oh, yeah, seven, there's a seven place for those, seven, the walkways get um, covered, and then I'm worried that we are gonna be somehow responsible for people not having access, people who, have a harder time getting to the station, people who are walking, people who are riding their bikes. So anyway, I just wanna, I wanna put that out there. And then the second thing I just, as you think about the policy in a broader context, um, I think the question that Member Carr asked is so interesting because of course, you know, they, it really does have to be customized to the area, but the, the, the benchmarks that you use for customization are worth um, us understanding. And so for example, Obviously, an end of line station that that is that doesn't have a lot of buses, or you know that that's a one that you obviously wouldn't negatively impact or 
you know, you make different parking choices than you would in an area that's much more dense, much more urban, and frankly, where parking stalls cost a certain amount, that may be something else we want to think about. You know, so anyway, thank you for mm -hmm. the work. Uh, Director Carr? Oh, I'm sorry. No, okay. Uh, are there questions or comments? No, I, I just had, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Director McAllister, sorry. I just had a comment. I just wanted to do a, a shout out for Director Perales for allowing us to bring, I, I've mentioned many times before about policies and it's, it uh, should get uh, discussed to the full board and I was proud to support his motion to bring these policy issues to the full board and I appreciate that. All right, um, I, I just wanted to uh, mention one issue and I know it's something that in the policy and uh, I saw in the responses to one of the committees has indicated something you guys would be working on more in the future. Um, Today, Director Davis and Pross and I released a memo relating to e-scooters, and I know they are becoming increasingly both a benefit and a burden to station access. Uh, I'm certainly hearing, not just here, but in lots of other cities, uh, they're left in places where there are obstacles for people, particularly with disabilities, to be able to get access to buses uh, or on station platforms. It's a real problem. We know there's issues with safety, just in the speed that they're moving and so forth. So anyway. Um, in the city of San Jose, we are hoping with the council approval in a couple of weeks, we'll move forward with a, a policy that will only give permits to those companies that are employing some geofencing technology. Um, we certainly would look forward to working with ETA on that uh, to ensure station platform areas in particular are geofenced and uh, we have some kind of orderly um, disposition of these devices uh, so that they're actually a benefit to mobility and not a challenge. Um, so anyway, um, I look forward to working on that in, in the months ahead. Any other questions? Okay, we have two uh, members of the community like to speak, uh, Mr. LeBron and uh, NDI. Oh, no, Mr. Okay, Mr. NDI would not like to. Okay, Mr. LeBron. So earlier I mentioned uh, Deirdre and us, uh, something that needs to be handled in a different way. And near where I live, we have got something very similar called Cotto Road. And this is parking day and it's full. But these people are not taking the light rail. It's actually used as an overflow for Kaiser. And there was this proposal, oh, we're gonna have some more TO, JD, or whatever. Well, we just build 5,000 units on the other side of the freeway. That's not the solution. We don't want more TO, JD. We want to make it possible for the people who live in that massive 5,000 unit transit village to have access to the light rail. All we need is an overpass. I mean, right now you're making people walk a mile, they're going to a freeway on ramp, the freeway off ramp is a miracle. We haven't killed half a dozen people by now. So the solution there is the same as Diridan. Let's enter into an exclusive negotiation agreement with Kaiser, and we tell them, Kaiser, okay, this is all yours, you're gonna pay us X dollars, but by the way, what we want out of it it's a ramp that's gonna, not just going to be connecting this massive transit village to the light rail, but it's also going to connect the transit village to Kaiser. And you know what? They're 100% with us. It's just a matter of going out there and talking to them, and let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, that motion is to both items. Is that right? Yes. All right. On the motion, any comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That passes. All right, we're on to 7.4, Silicon Valley Express Lanes Program Tool Ordinance. Uh, board introduced this ordinance last month and placed this item on tonight's agenda for adoption. There are no changes to the ordinance since its adoption. Motion and second. Uh, Director McAllister. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, this is 7.4 of the, the ordinance. That's right. I, yeah, okay, I just want to make the same comment I made before. I'm concerned about going with a product that uh, that somewhere down the line that this is a revenue stream and we may be hesitant to change it also considering that the we spent a lot of time on 5.5 X so I would like if there's some flexibility to put in I mean it's going to go forward but just to build something that could potentially be a continual revenue stream and that we don't look ways to to go to the next step of improving things, so I'll be voting no on this one. Thank you. Um, other comments? I don't have any cards, should I? No? 
Okay. All right. Uh, and there is a motion. All in favor? Any opposed? One no. Okay. On to 7.5. Uh, this is our uh, review and acceptance of the fiscal year 2019 statement of revenues and expenses for the period ending September 30th. Carol Lawson, our fiscal resources manager and budget, is here to provide the report. Hi, Carol. Thank you, Chair Licardo. The um, revenues for the first quarter of FY19 were $1.4 million below budget. Um, these were based on a couple of items. The combined transit and paratransit fares were $1, $1, huh, $1 million, sorry, um, under budget, lower, due to lower ridership, and that was offset somewhat by the special event service. The sales tax base revenues were $1.8 million under budget. The 2016 Measure B revenues were $3.6 million under budget as those funds are being held in, in escrow pending resolution of the litigation. And the STA funds were $4.5 million over budget, primarily from the additional funds that we now receive due to SB1. On the expense side, the Expenses were $11.4 million below budget. This was primarily due to savings from the delayed implementation of the planned service changes, as well as um, delayed timing of other services. Paratransit costs are under budget a little bit also, partly from lower ridership levels and part, partly from maintenance savings. Um, there is not a projection at this time for where we will end up. FY19, there are several reasons for that uh, that I've mentioned in the memo itself. Um, it is very early in the year and there are still a, a large number of unknowns, um, especially on the revenue side. The SB1 money is now much clearer. We know that we will be getting STA funds now that Proposition 6 has been defeated, but there is still uncertainty about 2016 Measure B and when it will become available and also um, the impact of sales tax unprocessed returns. The CDTFA, which is the state agency that um, administers the sales tax system, put in a new software system in April, and there were several issues with that. Um, there were about 80,000 unprocessed returns for the third and fourth quarter of our fiscal year 18. They are working through those, but those are not completely worked through yet, so we don't know uh, yet what that impact is going to be on our FY19 receipts. Um, on the expense side, we do know there will be some savings. We are not implementing the service that we had planned when we did the budget. We anticipate that will be about $20 million at least in savings, so we will definitely be under budget for the expenditure side. Um, but we. As I mentioned, we don't know yet what that final number will be. We do feel like it, the next, as we bring back the next quarter, when we close out the second quarter, we'll have more information at that time. Um, and we do think that if 2016 Measure B does become available and with the um, catch up of the sales taxes that was the issue and in addition to the additional monies from STA, and the reduced expenses, we do anticipate that we may, uh, we'll, we'll probably have a positive balance for FY19. We don't know yet what the magnitude of that will be, but I do want to caution that even then it won't be enough to fully fund our capital program that we um, were unable to put as much aside last year. We should be putting 30 to 35 million aside and we only put 5 million aside we have that same issue technically in FY19. So even a fairly large positive operating balance may not be enough to fund to fully fund the upcoming local share of the capital program. And we're also under our 15% reserve um, goal for the operating balance. So um, it, good news, but not as good as it may need to be. Okay. Thank you, Carol. All right, questions for the board? I just had one question. Uh, the, um, the transit fares are down. Of course, uh, there's an eight percent variance from what we budgeted. Uh, 
I was under the impression that we had sort of bottomed, <laughs> but apparently not. Um, that 8% number seems bigger than I might have expected. Is there a reason why there's such a big magnitude to that variance? Part of it is that, remember, we had assumed that we had would have a full year of the next network and the new additional oh, service. Okay. So uh, there was actually ridership increases assumed in the budget. Okay, so, oh, okay, I thought by the time we had done this budget, we had pushed that off, we hadn't. No, it was, it, at the it. time that we did the budget, it was assumed to start in December of last year, so we would have had a, a half a year roughly in FY18 and a full year in FY19. Okay. Makes sense, since we're claiming labor savings, it makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, unless there are any other questions, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, passes, thank you, Karen. Uh, on to item 7.6, is a presentation on VTA's funding sources and reserves. Carol is still here. Okay, this is still me. So at the last board meeting, there was a request um, from the board members to have a presentation of the different funding sources that VTA gets as well as our reserves. So um, I will try to be as informative yet brief as possible. Start with the funding sources. We do budget for eight different funds. Um, I've listed them here. I won't bother to read them because I'm gonna get into the, a little bit of information about each one, but these are the list of funds that we do um, a budget for on, in our biannual budget. So for each fund, I'm gonna go through kind of what the purpose of that fund is and then what the primary funding sources are. Transit fund is operation development and maintenance of transit service. It's the bus and light rail service. It's um, sometimes referred to as our general fund, although I, we don't always do that, but that is it's kind of the general idea. Although we do obviously have more business lines that we are involved in, this is the, the one that's the most in the, the public sees. The primary funding sources is, we've said many times, mostly sales taxes. Uh, primarily, the top four here are all sales tax based, the 1976 half cent. Um, we also get Transportation Development Act funds, which is a quarter cent for transit that comes to the count, uh, comes to VTA through MTC and the County of Santa Clara. We get a portion of 2000 Measure A as operating assistance. We also get a portion or hope to, once um, it becomes available, get a portion of 2016 uh, Measure B for one of the transit operations program area. We get passenger fares, and this includes paratransit fares. We get state transit assistance, um, which has now been um, bumped up with the implementation of SD1. Advertising revenues, we get federal grants, primarily those go towards <coughs> capital programs our capital projects, excuse me, and then we do get state grants also that are both operating in capital. Just for a little bit of context, this is the operating revenues that were budgeted for FY19, just so you can kind of see the order of magnitude where the big pieces of the pie are and where the smaller pieces of the pie. I would um, say that there are two things um, missing from this. The uh, grants that go towards capital are not included here obviously. And then at the time that we did the budget, we had not included the impact of SB1. So the state transit assistance number here is much smaller than we do anticipate seeing now. For the second one on the list was the 2000 Measure A uh, Transit Improvement Program. It is uh, designed purely for the planning and completion of projects that are specified in the ballot measure. The primary sources here are the sales tax itself. We also leverage those funds to get federal grants, state grants, and then we also get some local money from cities and other government agencies. The BART Operating Sales Tax Program Fund is also um, a sales tax item, but it's for specifically for the operating and maintenance expenses and the capital reserve for the, the Silicon Valley BART extension. Its primary sources are the sales tax that was passed in 2008 and began collection in 2012, and then also um, will be funded from BART fare revenues once service starts. 2016 Measure B is our newest program. It's the programs and projects that are in the categories detailed in the ballot. It also is the sales tax money with grants, both federal, state, and then also local funds in the cities and the counties. 
The congestion management program does the items that are listed here. Um, each of the cities is a member of the program as well as the County of Santa Clara and VTA is also a member. So the member agency fees as well as grants from federal and state agencies fund this particular program. The highway program is streets and roads, expressways, and multimodal projects that are identified in the Valley Transportation long-term plan. Its primary sources are grants. Um, now that we have 2016 Measure B, that will also be funding a large portion of these, and then uh, local monies from cities and county. The joint development program is aiming to generate revenue, promote TOD, and enhance transit operations. It is mainly funded through proceeds of sale of property and then property rentals. The Silicon Valley Express Lanes program is, maintains the express lanes in the two corridors listed here, and its primary source is from tolls. That is the, the quick and dirty long list of the eight. Um, there, with very few exceptions, there is not fungibility between the funds. Um, as I mentioned, some of the Measure A funds go to transit, some of the 2016 Measure B funds go to transit. Um, there are some potentials in the future for um, ongoing revenues from joint development and ongoing revenues from the express lanes to perhaps go to transit, but many of the other categories are very walled off due to um, either legal or ballot measure restrictions. Um, I'll, I'll pause for a moment for the, now that we've talked about the funding sources rather quickly to see if anybody has any questions about those before I move on to the reserves. Thanks, Joe. Questions, uh, Director Rennie? Thank you. Um, I, you went by kind of quick, but what I'm, uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, using capital to reduce costs of our systems. A lot of our capital, as you just showed us, is, is comes from sources that dedicates it to something. So what's not clear to me is how much of our capital or what percentage of our capital is, is really discretionary enough that we could go spend it on a cost reduction on a, a bus route or a light rail route or something like that. Well, if we're talking, so we're, okay, so we're, that's probably in the transit area because the other programs that fund capital projects are very prescribed which are eligible and which are not. So if we're talking about capital in the transit fund, um, a portion of that is grant funding, a portion of that is VTA local monies that come from the same sources as the operating budget that I talked about. So the local match for, let me go back to the pie chart for a minute we can see what I'm talking about. I mentioned that this chart doesn't include the federal grants. What this chart does include is the local match to those grants and then also any local um, need on top of that because we, as Nuria mentioned earlier, we have a backlog of, of capital program. Grants only cover so much, so local VTA money has to be the source for the rest, and it comes as from these sources. So the sales tax money, 76 sales tax, for example, as I mentioned in the purpose, is to maintain, develop, and provide the transit service. So 76 sales tax monies could be used to do those projects that would then save and reduce costs. So to, to circle back around and try to answer your question. Um, if, if those types of projects are something that are grant eligible, we could prioritize them and use grants and match with the local money. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, it, it's a little confusing because this actually says operating revenue, so I was assuming this was used for operations, um, and we're already having trouble getting enough money to fund operations so it would be very difficult to take operations money to fund to a capital improvement. You mentioned earlier, we, I, I thought I was understanding 
we wanted thirty million to come out of these that we could put into capital but we're only getting five so i don't feel like there's any money there either so i'm still not getting a good feel for where any any system efficiency capital improvement money might come from it has to come from the same sources that goes here so uh, when we were talking about the ad hoc and the the deficit we were looking at was 50 to 60 million that's operating and capital and the operating both pieces come from the same group of money we only for local funds for state of good repair in the transit fund these are the only sources for the local piece the the grant piece is there but we have to match the grant and we also have more need than the grants can cover so yes this says operating budget but 30 million dollars 30 to 35 million dollars of that should be going to the capital to fund the local share of our capital program and so maybe that begs a follow-on question um, for gr grants often have sort of very specific purposes are is the Things like efficiency improvements doesn't sound like something that granting agencies would put up a lot of money for. Um, is is there much grant for things like that? I mean, it's much easier to argue, you know, you know we, I don't know, maybe electrification of Caltrain. That's a good place to get a grant for, and maybe that is an efficiency improvement. It's not, but it's not the kind of things that I think we're thinking of. I, I hear what you're saying, and there are some grant programs that are for efficiency measures. And one of the challenges that we do have with our grants is there is a scoring system on a regional basis, and replacement and rehab scores higher than enhancements and new things. So that is that is a challenge that we are are faced with. Yes. That's what so I suspected. It, 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 yes. <laughs> But what it may mean is that we might not be able to use grant funds to do it. We may have to find a way to use local funds to do those types of projects that could ultimately save us money in the long run. Okay, thank you. I think I understand a little better. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on then to the... Okay, uh, let me find my way back here. Sure. All right, so let's talk about reserves. Um, what I want to do first is kind of give a, a framework, a little terminology, finance slash accounting 101, if you will. And this is an attempt to kind of get us all on the same page so that when we talk about reserves, that you understand what we mean when we talk about reserves. So um, if you're following along in your slide deck and you want to go to slide 19, there's actually a chart that... that um, Slows the, shows these out, and I don't know if you guys have, in fact, let me do it this way. Let me go to slide 19, and then I'll talk through the boxes. That makes more sense. Okay, so this chart um, spells out kind of what the relationship is that we're going to talk about here. So we start at the top with net position, and... Um, a lot of places that that's also known as net assets so basically it's your assets minus your liabilities it's your cash and your receivables and your investments and your um, physical assets less what you owe other people right so that's the the total amount of what your net assets are there are three components here one is unrestricted net position which is the third one on the right up there and that's basically your net position excluding what you have invested in capital assets and what is being restricted either um, in the restricted net position which is the funds that are legally restricted to a designated use an example of that is debt service we that's we have a legal um, re requirement to repay those debts those monies aren't available for other things they are restricted for just that so you've got net investment and capital assets, restricted net, net position, and then your unrestricted net position. So within unrestricted net position, there are the reserves over there to the left, 
which are the portion of the net position that's designated by the board to be used for a specific purpose. And for us, we have three um, areas here. One is the operating reserve, one is the debt reduction fund, and one is the sales tax stabilization fund. And I'll talk about those more in a moment. The other designated funds, the line on the right there, is the portion that's restricted by either board resolution, contractual requirements, or is just for, restricted for other practical purposes. It's not really available for discretionary use. The three um, examples here are the local share of capital projects, and this is the local money for projects that have already been appropriated. They've, been, they've gone through the budget process, We've made a commitment to do those projects, so those funds are set aside by board resolution in this particular fund. We also have the net OPEB asset, which is our other post-employment benefit. We have funds that are specifically for our retiree medical program. And then the third category here is inventory and prepaid expenses. And those are set aside mostly just because they're not very liquid. They aren't really useful to be using to fund other things. The top right corner up there, um, the little dotted line to the internal service funds, these are also a subset, if you will, of unrestricted net position, and they're used to account for all or a portion of our risk financing activities and certain other liabilities. And the examples here are workers' compensation, our general liability, we are self-insured, and then also compensated absences. So the part that we talk about when we're talking about reserves is this bottom left-hand corner here that I've highlighted in red. So I'm going to talk about each one of these just a little bit more. The operating reserve and the sales tax stabilization fund could be referred to and sometimes are referred to as rainy day funds. The debt reduction fund is um, where we put aside the local share of capital for upcoming capital projects. I talked about the other um, restricted fund are the ones that have already been decided what projects they're going to be. We've already put them in the budget We've committed to doing them. We've set those, that, those dollars aside. This is where we hold the money for what we're going to do in the next two-year budget cycle. And that's the 30 to $35 million per year that I've been referring to. So I'm going to talk about these in, in individually, and then I'll come back again to that chart. Uh, our operating reserve, it's been a long-standing practice. We've done it since 1991, but it was formalized in FY12 with a policy. Um, the purpose is to ensure that we have funds available if there are unexpected expenses or um, revenue shortfalls from sources other than sales taxes, because we have a separate um, way to deal with the sales taxes. The goal here is 15% of the operating expenses it's funded from positive operating balances. And the current balance is at the end of fiscal year 18, so as of June 30, was 54.8 million or 11.1%. Um, in order to be at the 15% goal, it would need to be at 74 million. The sales tax stabilization fund, I referenced that just a moment ago, that we have a separate mechanism for the sales taxes uh, revenues. It was established in FY11. It's to mitigate the impact of sales tax volatility. Its current balance is 35 million, which is the maximum allowed by the current policy. The third item is the debt reduction fund. It was established in 2007-2008 um, per time period. It has a long list here of what it can be used for, but primarily it provides, as I said, it's kind of the savings account, if you will, for the local share of upcoming capital projects. The funding for this um, previously, previous to several years ago, we took what I would call a passive approach, where we, uh, if we had positive operating balances, to whatever extent, they would flow into this fund. Um, recently, we've gone, and I re recommend that we continue, more of an active approach, where we actually budget a transfer from the operating budget to this 
fund so that it's available for the next two year budget. The current balance here sadly is $5 million. We need 30 to 35 per year at this rate. We will only have $10 million at the end of this year for the next two year budget. So back to my reserves table here. Um, I mentioned that the two on the left are rainy day funds. I think of this a little bit differently. Um, I explain it that the two on the left are in order to be prepared for things you hope don't happen. And the one on the right, the debt reduction fund is to be prepared for things that need to happen. Um, here is a chart of the historical balances of those three reserves over the last five years. You'll see that the last four has been declining rapidly. Um, and we are sitting at $95 million at the end of FY18. That's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Way to end on a happy note. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Questions, uh, Director Rennie? Uh, so I was curious you, um, how you're investing some of the funds. So you had an OPEB fund. Is that invested in something like an IRS 115 where you can invest at higher rates of return? OPEB is in what's called a Section 115 trust, that's an IRS section, and that's invested separately. In other words, there's a separate investment policy for that, that we could invest in uh, any of the funds we normally invest, like not just OPEB, but pension funds too. So wh what we have done in the last about two, two and a half years now, our ATU, VTA pension fund balance is a little over $500 million, and OPEB is about 300 For investment purposes only, not for, we've not commingled anything. For investment purposes only, we invest them in more or less like kind of assets. Uh, typically, we had what's called a 60-40 mix, 60 stocks, 40 uh, fixed income. For the last two to three years, we have diversified a little bit. We have uh, reduced our exposure to fixed, uh, fixed income because interest rates had been falling quite a bit. So we have a few hedge funds in that, uh, which would give us a little bit more of a return than a, a bond fund, if you will, but not increasing the risk at the same time. On the equity side, we do have a pretty robust mix of a, a, a port portfolio, which includes domestic equities, a small portion in emerging markets, and uh, global funds as well. And so it <clears throat> sounds like your your target long term return is six six percent kind of return. Uh, on, seven, on the way seven you're investing, seven you're investing percent. seven. Okay. Se seven percent. And then how are we investing our other cash sitting in uh, in the reserves? As and w <coughs> what return are we seeing? It as that's the one and three quarter kind of return right now. Or? No, th 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 those are all pretty much subject to the state investment guidelines for such functions. We're a governmental agency, so they're predominantly in very safe, liquid assets. Uh, we have, um, by, by policy as well, as well as the state law, some of it, about $50 million of that is in what's called LAFE, which is with the state government, which is a local agency uh, investment fund. So we need to have something liquid to meet our uh, immediate needs. And the rest are in uh, either, uh, a plus or double A or triple A bonds, either corporate or uh, U.S. Treasury bonds. And, and what mature um, <coughs> years are you focusing on? Uh, the maturity cannot exceed 10 years by, by law and by our policy. And the duration, not maturity, the duration is about 2.8 years. Okay, thank you. All right, other uh, questions? We need a motion to accept this? We should. Just information item. Just an information item. We don't. Okay, we'll move on then. Thanks, Carol. Here we go. Uh, back to our consent calendar. Uh, Mr. McAllister, you pulled item 6.5. Okay. On uh, 6.5, I was reading about how the engineer's estimate was lower than the actual and Mountain View seems to have the same issues with that kind of deal. It's just really tough out there with this market that everything is just so high and much demand it's hard to get a, a good price on something. My question is basically going forward, uh, if you have limited vendors, how can we, considering let's go back to when we were talking about the ad hoc committee and their 
their uh, goals. Going forward, this, how are you going to be able to control costs with something like this that seems to be an ongoing expense, but it's always going to be es escalating? Is there policies or thoughts, or you just got to pay what you got to pay on that? Generally speaking, uh, we uh, approach the marketplace uh, looking for contractors to bid on the work. Um, this is typically uh, done throughout the development of the project scope. Many of the contractors are aware of the work that we are preparing for putting out for bid. Uh, when the uh, market uh, provides more opportunities for contractors than there are contractors, then they choose which projects they're going to work on, and that's essentially what we have here. In other words, there's a lot of work out there for contractors. so. Um, uh, we have a, a group of contractors that do this kind of work for us. Uh, some of them are either busy on other work and aren't available, or they are simply pursuing uh, other opportunities at other agencies where they feel like they are at more combat competitive advantage. So in this case, you know, we're a victim, or victim, or we're subject to the the marketplace in general, and that reflects itself in a lower number of bids and higher bids. And in this case, you know, our estimating is uh, uh, is informed by what our assessment is of the market demand, but it's not an accurate uh, assessment. It's difficult to gauge because it fluctuates over time. There aren't, uh, for this type of work, there are a number of contractors that can do this kind of work. It's not that limited, but uh, it is specialized work nonetheless. So what's the lifetime of, I mean, the span of there before you have to do it again? Uh, and are there I, uh, things to look at that you can make it? I believe this contact wire that we're replacing is original, so it's a couple of decades already. That's generally true. Um, uh, the, this scope includes not only the contact wire, but many of the pertinences that go on with it. So this doesn't happen very often. So when we look, go out for a bid, do we say, hey, can you improve this design? Can you upgrade it so it lasts longer? Or do you just go basically to replace what you have? I'm sorry, Member McAllister, I didn't hear your question. The question is, when you go out to bid, do you ask them if they can upgrade the system? Can they make an improvements on the system that it has a longer life? Or is the contract just to sort of replace the status quo on that particular item? Uh, uh, they don't operate the system. Uh, generally, we specify the uh, materials to be installed and the methods by which they install, and in this case, um, the work windows w within which they install. If, if I may, Mr. McAllister, um, one of the things that I think it's worth mentioning is that it's our responsibility really to do the research. If technology is advancing um, and if there's an opportunity to modernize, we will certainly take that into consideration. But given the fact that these cables are throughout our service area for the light rail, uh, if there is a major design, uh, for instance, if we no longer have aerial cables, <laughs> and we're not using catenary on our light rail, we come up with another type of technology for our vehicles that now requires it to be embedded, we would be specifying that. But those will be policy decisions that are driven also by uh, what's available in the market from a technical perspective, and then the direction that the organization will be going forward in the future. And we'll be talking more about that uh, at our Future of Transportation workshop. Yeah, I think my terminology was incorrect, but I think you were, if we were yeah, modernizing it, and is that a normal, is that an automatic policy that as these projects come up, we try to do that? Uh, well, it works two ways. Uh, we, we're certainly always looking for better ways to deliver the service, uh, looking at assets, but also the industry. The industry evolves. And uh, the, as Dennis mentioned, it's been 30 years since we designed and built the light rail system. So clearly, if the industry is moving in a different direction, if they have a better um, way of uh, different cable sizes that can carry more power, a uh, better way of doing the contact with our vehicles, all of that would be taken into consideration. So it's us doing research about what's best for our organization and what would be much more efficient, but also what does the industry have available? Okay. And I'd just like to add, just like to add that uh, I think we talked uh, earlier in this evening about state of good repair. Uh, this is an element of that. Um, we uh, assess 
the condition of the existing facilities and for those areas that need uh, attention like this one does, uh, we issue a contract of this nature. This is not the entire contact rail throughout the system. Okay. Thank you. And then I'll, I can do 6-6 six, six and make one motion you, for that too. You, okay, you want to take motions together? Uh, go, go ahead. So on 6-6 six, six is the one that's the mill tilde improvement. And um, I keep asking about the 101, you know, 237 onto 101 on-ramp is always the one that really gets backed up. And is there any way that we can try to solve two problems at one time? Or is, I know Sunnyvale put in some money on this, but that's an uh, intersection that also can be proved. And since they're right next to each other, is there any ability to take care of two at one time? Yeah, Jim Gonzalo, uh, capital program manager. Uh, the contract actually includes improvements at 101 and Matilda. We are converting that interchange to a partial flow levy. Well, I know that intersection, but like 100 yards down the road, there's the off ramp from 237 to get on to 101. Okay. That's the intersection that, because that has, you got two lanes, three lanes, and they're all trying to get on to 101 going north, and there's a huge backup on that particular section. Well, that, that, that would be a, a different project. I know. That's why I'm asking. If you, there are bodies there, can the, in, somehow be incorporated to solve that problem? Um, well, it, it's obviously we're, we're done with the, with the design for this project. So um, that's something that we'd have to look into uh, to uh, talk to over with Caltrans and see what we can do at that in intersection or interchange. Okay. Uh, may I offer, Mr. McAllister, that uh, since you have raised this matter, brought, brought this to our attention on numerous occasions, Fine. we clearly will be looking um, at uh, the issues that are affecting mobility in that particular uh, ramp and working with Caltrans as they de design or they develop their plan for this coming year, for the next, their five-year plan. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to uh, remove my request for 6.7 and make a motion that we uh, adopt 6.5 and 6.6. .6. Okay, and then we need a motion on 6.7 as well. Okay, and, and yeah, support okay. 6.7. All right, there's a motion and a second. I'm going to recuse myself from all those items uh, under the government code section related to conflicts of interest. All right, is there any other comment? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, that passes. So uh, we're on to 6.9. Um, I, I pulled this consent item. I just had two very quick questions, I think, for you, Ron. Uh, I know you've had lots of inquiries. Uh, you can probably guess which two sites I'm talking about. First, the Chevron station on 4th and Santa Clara, uh, where there's a lot of, a lot of interest. Uh, I, I took a look at the map about, I know there's some potential use for construction staging. Uh, it seems like if we're going to close down Santa Clara, we could probably lengthen the staging area just within Santa Clara's right away, but you guys know the construction. I don't. Uh, I guess the real question for me is how soon till we can sort of land the plane to let the property owner know whether or not they are going to be, their site is going to be needed for staging? Um, that is a great question, and I'll take a stab at it and ask uh, perhaps others to add to it. Um, you know, I think the important thing to understand is that at this point, at the time that we approved the project, we have we approved the environmental document and identified all the properties that represent the maximum potential requirement. Um, we're at 10 percent design. Um, we need to get beyond 10 percent design. That will start happening with an action that will be coming to the board next month with respect to the general engineering consultant. Um, it's hard for me to say to you what exactly the time frame is. I would express that my hope would be that by the middle to later part of next year, we'll have a much better sense that we will progress enough in that design process to have gotten to a better understanding. But I have to, again, say that you know, the engineering process will play out the, w the way the engineering process Do, does. Can we only proceed past 10% design once we have a full funding grant agreement, or can we accelerate? Yeah, so the, the reason that we are bringing the general engineering consultant on board is so that we can move beyond the 10% and get the design to a level that we can develop a cost estimate that will be submitted in our proposal for the funding application. Oh, okay. Uh, so that uh, it's correct what, uh, Mr. what Ron is saying is that um, it's too early to determine. We just 
we identified all of our needs and said, well, these are the parcels where we will put them. But as we can, we refined the design with this consultant coming on board, we'll have a better idea of actually what we need and where it needs to be. Okay. So, so uh, if you could, uh, next, year, next year, this time, we will have a better, uh, much better idea. Okay. Uh, of whether we need that parcel or not. Great. Well, I'm sure we'll continue this conversation offline. Thank you very much for that. And then secondly, uh, our friends at Apple, I know have a, a site over there in Santa Clara. Mm -hmm saw the letter from their lawyers. I know they put a lot of money into that, and it's going to be perhaps tens of millions of dollars uh, to move. Uh, I don't know exactly what, but it sounded like it was a lot. Um, I know there are statutory limitations on our costs for relocation, um, but I'm guessing they also would invoke Fifth Amendment claims if we're just going to say, oh, we'll pay you 25 grand or whatever it is. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is how how confident are we in the statutory limitations on relocation costs? Um, you know, I might frame it a little differently than that, and I might ask Karen if, Edelman, who's our yeah, panel from Salt If, if I may, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, before Ron gets into the details on that, I just want to state that um, we are working very cooperatively and collaboratively with Apple. As a matter of fact, Ron and uh, the general counsel had an opportunity to meet with them on site and better understand their needs. Uh, and as we stated to them, and I'm happy to state here publicly, that until we know with our design where we're going to be, I think it's a little premature just to start um, uh, having conversations about whether what the cost would be to relocate them. Uh, very similar, a little different than the property at 4th and Santa Clara, but uh, along the same uh, process, the same journey is the, our ability to finalize the design or at least get it advanced to a level that gives us a better understanding of what our alignment is, what our needs are, how much of the influence zone around the area that we're building we're need to, um, we will need to capture. Okay. So we may, it may be the case that we don't need the parcel. I, I wouldn't say that, but I think okay. building on what General Manager, uh, Manager Fernandez said, I just want to acknowledge that Apple has actually been very helpful during this relocation of time process in doing what it's intended to do, which is they have met with us and they provide us additional information on what they've done with the property they lease and the improvements they've made, and that's information that is being incorporated into the relocation plan. But again, in terms of what the final design is and how exactly that affects the property and how these matters are processed, it's just too early, too early to say, really. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ron. Uh, Director Chavez? Um, so. Just two, two quick things. One is um, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I, I was going to chime in, but I think they, um, you addressed the concerns relative to some of these bigger properties. Um, I, one thing I'm really interested in better understanding is um, what we do, what are our options relative to businesses that may be smaller or lower income in terms of their ability to relocate? And I read the report. I understand what the options are relative to housing. Um, but it may be worth us just thinking a little bit about this topic. I don't, I'm, I don't have a suggestion right now, but this topic relative to the, um, the work that the staff will be doing on the business interruption fund mm -hmm. for that um, Raul and I are asking you to research. And mostly because if we are um, in a situation where it's very difficult to relocate a business, what, if any, options may we have? Sure. Let, let me make an important distinction here, which is that the, the relocation plan is the, about the subject of businesses that have to relocate because of I understand. acquisition. When we talk about the business in I absolute, proposal, I understand. that's about here, here's a different Here's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is that one of the um, challenges we had with um, bus rapid transit is that we had some businesses that had the capacity, the ability to hire a lawyer, the mm -hmm. skill set to understand the documents they were getting. Right. and could frankly be a lot more aggressive and assertive with us, and fine. Um, what I'm really wondering is for those businesses that may be in our relocation needs, and you know, and the, I, I want to be clear that I understand that the needs of the many, and it's a hundred-year mm -hmm. uh, program, as we've discussed with some of our other mm -hmm. par business partners, are, are really critical. But I want I want us to better think through what options, if any, and that may mean, for example. If we need to move a small business that, that couldn't easily be relocated 
um, whether or not we want to look to other partners, other cities. We have a lot of cities that are sitting here that may have downtowns that are in need of with empty um, uh, you know, storefronts. I just want us to be a little creative, and I recognize that doesn't rest on the this. This is a much more legal, forthright process, but I do want us to think a little bit about that. And I'd be just interested in better understanding what options may have been used by other communities. Sure. And, and let me say that, obviously, the plan is about identifying what we're obligated to do, but our intent as we proceed with this is to be as creative and broad-minded and flexible within the parameters we have to operate within. Um, what I'd like to do is actually ask Karen Edelman, who's our consultant and the technical expert on the subject, to maybe perhaps add to, to, uh, to that. Thank you. Yes, oh good, the challenge um, that many businesses face. And um, the federal regulations do address the fact that the expertise needs to be from us and without cost to the businesses. So a relocation advisor is available to work with each business and resident, but each business that, um, so that we can clearly uh, articulate the relocation program and really try and understand what their needs are and understand how best the relocation program can help. Um, and then to provide the assistance is exactly what you're saying. It's what can we do to help you find a place mm -hmm. that meets your needs? You know, sometimes that is moving um, down the street and sometimes it's moving to another community. Um, it, every single one is business specific. And um, our goal is to really work with the businesses and get to know them and see what we can do to help provide that assistance which is our obligation by law. Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, uh, we'll entertain a motion. Oh, Mr. LeBron, I'm sorry, forgive me. So going back to Full Street, rather than thinking about that gas station, what I would really like to start thinking about is the City Hall Plaza and maybe relocating a few uh, parking spaces in the City Hall parking garage. And the reason why you might want to do that is twofold. First of all, you don't want hundreds of San Jose State students coming from one state of Santa Clara going across the street. It's just asking for trouble, just like the situation in San Carlos right now. So you want these people to be coming out of Bath on the City Hall side, and then using the City Hall uh, essentially Paseo, which is where Fifth Street used to be to get into San Jose State. That's point, of, um, that's point number one. Now, I'm trying to remember the other, yeah. The other thing you need to think about is long, long term, I know it's a moonshot, long term we're gonna be undergrounding the light rail. And the only way to underground the light rail without impacting existing light rail operations is to actually underground it under full street. At that point in time, you will really want to start designing a hub right there in the City Hall Plaza when you got an interconnection between BART and underground light rail. I'll be happy to help you out with that, know exactly how to do it. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion? Motion, uh, second, all in favor? Any opposed? All right, uh, we're on to item 6.10. I believe this was pulled see here, we have public comment. Mr. Beekman? You pass, okay. Uh, is there a motion or a comment? That was, did you pull this one? Uh, I, did, I did not pull it, uh, okay. but, but I will talk about it. At <laughs> <laughs> I, You're under no eight. obligation to talk about it. Yes. But <laughs> I was prepared later, not now. <laughs> All right, would you like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, okay, you don't want a motion. All right. Uh, item 611 has several uh, members of the community like to speak. So uh, let's go to that item now. Uh, Roland LeBron. I'm sorry, 6.11. Did I say 7? I'm sorry, 6.11. Yes, so let me call the item properly. That's... Uh, so, so the, the issue... The North San Jose Deficiency Plan update. Thank okay. you. So the issue I had there is if you look at the map of, of the study, it stops at Highway 237, 
Well, guess what? Google had just bought half a million dollars on the other side of Highway 237. So that basically is not part of the plan. Now, if you go back to what we tried to get you to measure B, there's something called the, uh, um, uh, the, the VTA Sprinter project. We had the station in El Viso. That's exactly why that station in El Viso was for, is to provide connectivity between that not, not the most tip of San Jose to Diridan in about 15 or 20 minutes without having to spend, you know, 45 minutes on the light rail or whatever. You know, that's what that was about. And I, then I also brought that up at council on Tuesday. We've got this massive area over there, 350 acres, which is basically begging for affordable housing right next to Google. And you know what? If Google expand over there, they can actually build something twice the size of Diridan. So I suggest you include that in the study somewhere. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beekman? And after Mr. Beekman is uh, Robin uh, Rumor. I guess I should ask uh, your opinion uh, if I can. Uh, this is about this is about the uh, tra traffic uh, traffic con congestion <laughs> traffic congestion. Uh, in the North San Jose area around new housing projects. I wanted to quickly mention a few thoughts about traffic congestion in the District 5 area of San Jose. Is that possible I can do that here at this time? No. Okay, well, it's a concern of mine what's going on over there, and I'd like to talk about it in broader detail, and I will in the future, okay. and uh, they can be aware of it. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Uh, sir, forgive me if I mispronounce it, a rumor? All right, we'll take that. Thank you. Currently, city staff proposes to leave this San Jose deficiency plan from 13 years ago basically as is, and that's a very conservative approach, and I think that's not a good approach because it's not a good plan. Let me give you two reasons why. One is we're trying to get people to walk and bike and use transit more, and San Jose has an official goal of significantly reducing the number of people who drive to work. Now let's assume we are successful with that for some reason, and I hope we are. Why do we want to spend millions and millions of dollars, much of it from BTA Measure B, on widening roads if we have fewer cars? And second, and even more importantly, looking at this the other way around. Does this plan help us get to this goal? And the numbers don't work. It's a car-centric and LOS-focused plan, and city staff agrees with that, that past traffic studies have shown that if this plan stays as it is, over 80% of trips related to North San Jose will be in a car. So this plan would continue to lead us down the wrong path. This plan is either one, unnecessary, or B, outright harmful, neither of which is good. To loosely quote our chairperson, I hope I don't misquote, we've built much of our cities around cars, Let's build them around people instead. Thank you. Thank you. Always appreciate when people quote me. You can talk anytime you want. All right. <laughs> is, there a, is, is there a motion? Oh, there, okay. No more motions. We're done with that. All right. Uh, we're on to item uh, 8.1, which is the report of our general manager. Well, thank you very much, and good evening to all of you. I, um, this year really flew by, but I can't say the same for this board meeting. We have, <laughs> I, I feel that my year, year report is going to have to get on a fast track. Um, you know, the essence of this organization is in the heart of the people. Uh, so let me begin by thanking all 2,200 employees that work for the VTA. And that includes the ones that didn't show me any love tonight, because I love them back. I do. <laughs> I also, thank you. I, um, I'm very proud of this team. They have done yeoman's uh, work with uh, resources that continue to decrease. Uh, we've had to hold the line on uh, hot filling vacancies. Uh, we are only replacing 50% of our attrition and we have about a 7% attrition a year. So that means that we're doing more with less. So thank you, thank you, thank you, VTA. Uh, 
I also want to acknowledge the Board of Directors and the uh, member, all, the alternates, uh, the advisory committee members uh, for actively engaging really in guiding us and supporting the policies, plans, and projects that we bring before you. It, uh, it's a volunteer work. I know some of you are designated or assigned, but the reality is without your guidance, it would be very difficult for us uh, to make any headway. And there are a lot of very important decisions, some very important high-level policies that we really need the guidance and we need approval so that we can deliver the best quality service, not only to our, our riders, but also to our end users. This year, our organization celebrated important milestones on a professional and personal level, but we also mourned the loss of colleagues and we navigated the challenges and tribulations that come with being at the forefront of mobility for residents of one of the largest counties in our region. So I am very impressed by the resolve, the resiliency, and pride that every single member of this organization demonstrates by putting our customers and end users first. We're not an organization of buses, trains, and highways and assets. We are an organization of people who help people find solutions to their mobility needs. And our employees are truly the heart of this organization and our most important asset. So how, how did we do this year? Uh, on the stabilization front of, of our financing condition, I, we reduced a 20 million operating budget deficit by 30% to 5.8 million, in part through the delay of the BART service operations and implementing just part of the bus rail net network, network service. But a large part of it resulted from holding the line on our expenditures, prioritizing the hiring of safety and op operations critical positions. And in addition to that, of course, um, what I mentioned earlier was just filling 50% of the vacancies in attrition, but also refinancing the, uh, the high interest uh, loans, insurance premiums, and managing risk and exposure and claims. And it takes really savvy people uh, to help get us there. So thank you to our finance division, our operating division, our planners, and, and certainly every single one of the individuals that thought about these things to help us continue uh, taking uh, down some of the uh, challenges that we had faced coming into the year. This amount does not include, as you have heard repeatedly, the 30 million needed annually for our VTA's local share to fund our capital program. So the direction that we have gotten today from the uh, ad hoc committee and that you have endorsed is really gonna set us on the right path. And we look forward to coming back to you with the work plan, uh, addressing how we're gonna be dealing with each of these findings. Uh, this past November, we got some great news. We've talked about this at nauseum, but it's still worth repeating, that defeating the Proposition 6 was one of the greatest accomplishments uh, in 2018. Uh, it would have been a disaster. If we thought we were close to a cliff, I think we would have gotten there so much sooner had uh, the voters not st stood up and said, no, we are going to continue with this program uh, funding so that we can have an infrastructure that can help not only meet our needs, but help us grow as an economy. Uh, but um, there are some other measures that are still on hold and uh, we're still prevented for, from reaching or into the escrow account that has over $270 million in sales taxes as we await the final disposition of the legal system. As you may know, last Wednesday, the plaintiff in the Measure B lawsuit filed a petition with the California Supreme Court for review of the Court of Appeals decision. So this just feels like it's dragging on and on and on. And I will defer to the um, general counsel if you have any further questions as to what that timeline now looks like. But what I can tell you is we do not have access to 270 million plus dollars to do the kinds of things that uh, we had organized ourselves around and deliver on those nine program areas that the voters voted on uh, two years ago. Uh, while, um, at this time, the outcome of that petition, in addition to where we are with the Regional Measure 3, is still um, pending. We will be uh, working with uh, the cities. Uh, I try to identify any other resources we have been asked uh, to consider um, getting uh, support 
uh, financial support with, from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So there are other ways that we can at least try to find some small dollars to keep some of our planning studies going. Uh, we are very grateful for actions taken by cities such as Sunnyvale to provide us with the $20 million. Thank you very much, uh, alternate member <laughs> uh, Hendricks. And, um, but that is, as you know, it's not going to be enough. And what we really need is uh, bold steps so that we can move forward. Oh, okay. I was just uh, informed that the balance is not 270 million, it's 320 and growing. So yes, we need to put our hands on the escrow account for 2016 Measure B. On the, <laughs> on the safety and security front, uh, safety and security of the public and our employees is our number one priority. Tragically, this year we experienced three fatalities in two separate incidents on our light rail, and the loss of one life is too many. So building awareness regarding safety on and around our light rail continues to be paramount. We're, we have enhanced our safety awareness programs. We have demonstrated our various campaigns uh, at different meetings uh, before the board. We have come up with flyers, posters, videos, working with the um, with the schools and the unified school districts so that they can disseminate information and counting on every single one of you uh, in this room and those that would lis listen to this broadcast later to become an advocate and to be able to amplify the voices of those of us who have the responsi direct responsibility for ensuring safety. Safety is everyone's responsibility and we're, we're hoping that uh, together and collectively we can eliminate, we can go to a zero issue, uh, vision zero, and eliminate all of these um, tragic situations. On the security side, uh, we have experienced a downward trend in violent crimes on our system, and we've been working very closely with members of our largest bargaining unit, the Amalgamated Transit Union, they were here this evening, as we address issues of operator safety and operator assaults. So now let me move on to, to operations. Ridership uh, is moving in a positive direction, while bus and light rail combined recorded a 2.4% decrease in 2018. This is favorable as we, relate, as we compare that to the 8.5% ridership decrease a year ago. And furthermore, the rail ridership uh, increased 5.4% in the month of October. And we believe that it's in due part to the Mountain View Winchester line. We increase the frequency in that line to 15 minutes. And we have seen an uptick in the uh, users, uh, the using of that line. Uh, now, we're not just gonna sit on our laurels and, and pat ourselves on the back. We need to continue looking at ways that we can improve and draw more people to our system. I, I, I think at this point, I wanted to just make a, um, a remark around uh, ridership and utilization. The reason that we track our ridership through trips and we don't track it through individuals is because those number of trips are the ones that we report into the national transportation database, which is the, tra the database of the Federal Transit Administration. And that is the number that the federal government looks at when they are gonna be allocating funding. So it's not just about population and population density, it's about the number of trips that are generated on an annual basis by the transit agency. So it's very, and I, I think that's important because I've been hearing uh, commentary about, well, if it's one person and they're transferring, that should only continue to be counted as one person. It's every trip that's taken on our system. Uh, but as we think about uh, other ways that we can be improving our ridership, we are, our marketing group has come up with a very robust program where we're targeting employers uh, that are within half a mile of VTS light rail station so they can subscribe to our smart pass program. So encouraging their employees to shift uh, to mass transit. Participation in the smart pass has increased by 84,000 participants. Uh, over the last five years, more than doubling the revenue from that program. And I'm also gonna pause here and take this opportunity for a commercial. I was very disheartened when I read the article in the Mercury News about the um, Santa Clara County providing 
uh, valet service to its employees uh, that drive. And I understand that there's going to be a lot of construction and there's, there's going to be uh, no longer the easy access to parking. But Santa Clara County is one of our largest smart pass participants. And if we can get more people using the public transportation system, I think that we will start to see not only a turn, but then you will also see a return on investment. Because the Smart Pass program is our um, revised or refreshed eco program. And what it does is we get the money from you for a bulk number of employees. So they clearly have access to the system at any time throughout the year. <laughs> Thanks for that. No, no claps from our Santa Clara County reps. <laughs> Sorry, but I just had to say that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, another, uh, another great thing that happened uh, this year is that we went electric. So VTA, as we had shared with you, uh, we were going to be entering into a contract with Proterra for electric buses. And because we're committed to reducing carbon emissions uh, by transitioning to an electric system install and installing charging stations. So we had five electric buses that were delivered to us. They all, each of them has a range of 200 miles on a single charge. And uh, we're taking action to convert um, our buses, uh, per, uh, a large percentage of our buses, to electric by the year 2040 so that we can meet the California Air Resources Board 2040 zero emissions bus mandate. Uh, we have assigned our first five buses to the, the Line 10. And um, it's a, because that area that it, the, the, that it circulates has been designated as an air mitigation area. Uh, we will be expecting another five buses um, at the end of either this year or early next year. Uh, next year, I've been told. And uh, then we will continue to grow the fleet. It's been a great testing opportunity for us. We had some early bugs and worked very closely with Proterra to have those rev uh, revised. And we're also looking at adding additional charging station. We have one charging station at Cerrone. But as we get more, if we gr as we grow the fleet, we expand, expand the service area that they're going to be covering, we'll be placing charging stations. And it's also an opportunity to... Um, create partnerships, because I know that the city of San Jose and others are also looking to electrify their fleet uh, at the airport and then also their motor pools. And this will be an opportunity for us to start thinking about how we leverage these, these charging stations rather than having all of us put in a whole uh, mushroom pad of uh, charging stations throughout the, the, the county. We are researching programs that may offer greener and cleaner electricity at a cost lower than we annually pay in electric bills to PG&E. Uh, we support what, the, what San Jose Clean Energy and the Silicon Valley Clean Energy are doing in this space, and we will evaluate their cost data to better understand if joining a community of service providers will have a positive impact on our electric and transportation programs as we see those programs continue to grow. Uh, no, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we did on uh, building regional connectivity. Uh, as you know, I've been saying time and time again that it's not just about buses and trains. It's really about the entire transportation network, highways, freeways, expressways, bicycle, pedestrian, and, uh, bicycle and pedestrian paths. So on the express lanes, uh, major road interchanges and corridor studies are in varying stages of uh, progress uh, affected by the inability to access the 2016 Measure B and the Regional Measure 3 funds. We were really banking on those. Uh, so we're, we've taken these efforts, I think I mentioned it uh, earlier in my remarks, to um, work with cities and then also work with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and then looking at some grants as we're closing out projects to see if we can cobble together some, some nuggets uh, and keep some of these studies going. But um, the, the bottom line is that access to the funding sources that will give us the biggest bang for being able to not only complete pl the plans, uh, complete studies, design, but build these uh, improvements is what's needed. Uh, the other regional connectivity uh, is, of course, BART to Silicon Valley. And I share everyone's frustration that another year has gone by and we're still not enjoying a ride on BART uh, from Warm Springs to Milpitas in San Jose. But that day is much closer. Uh, the delay is unfortunate but essential to the safe operation of the system. So let me just share a, a bright spot. 
Following the discovery of the non-compliant parts, we have now secured all 1,000 of the replacement parts. Those have been initially tested, so we know that they're legitimate. And um, the installation is currently underway. We anticipate completing that installation in the first quarter of 2019. And Dennis uh, Ratcliffe, when he gave us the presentation on the Silicon Valley Rapid Transit Program, will be elaborating on the progress. Uh, regarding the second phase of the BART extension, we received a record of decision from the Federal Transit Administration this past June, and that allows us to transition into the project engineering uh, and position us for eligibility of federal funding to supplement our local and state funds. We are going to be bringing an action to you next month, uh, which is the award of a contract for the general engineering consultant. And that's the contract uh, consulting firm that's going to be designing the solution to our underground uh, subway and um, the uh, six miles uh, extension, the final extension to this program. And it's also going to give us um, good cost information that we will be including in our application to the federal government. And regarding that application, uh, I just want to remind you that uh, we are going to be pursuing the expedited project delivery pilot program. Uh, the federal government agreed that we would put our full funding grant agreement process on a hold so that we could pursue this other funding source that we believe will give us a, uh, an answer sooner and will give us access to funding uh, if we are successful and we are counting on being successful much sooner can start the project on time, finish it earlier. I had the opportunity last week to meet with Acting Administrator Jane Williams, so I was um, very encouraged by her uh, interest in the type of innovation that we're bringing to the Silicon Valley with this project. Uh, not only to be, will be the first ones in the nation to use a single board to build our uh, a transit um, system, but we're also, uh, we are the first to have approached her regarding using this expedited project delivery. And in that project delivery, one of the requirements is a P3. There's a P3 public-private partnership as one of the elements that are critical to the uh, selection of um, uh, uh, a project that, that will meet the EPD or expedited project delivery criteria. And we are looking at a construction approach that would satisfy that B3. So I am um, encouraged by, by her and um, uh, the support that we have received from the Federal Transit Administration staff and also I want to thank um, the VTA team together with our consultants that have helped us not only identify solutions but help us put package those solutions in a way that leave without any doubt that not only are we serious to get this done but that we are going to be doing it and um, establishing a model for the rest of the industry to follow. The, um, the next item I wanted to talk about was our congestion management. That is one of our areas of responsibility. And the, the situation in not only the Valley, but this region continues to worsen. We, are, we have now seen that in this entire nation, the, the increase in carbon emissions has reached a level that, uh, to be perfectly frank, the survival of the human race is now at the number one public health issue crises for this country. So, okay, there we go. <laughs> we are, we've been working uh, very collaboratively and engaging with cities and the county and major employers on congestion management solutions and looking at uh, support uh, from them as the multimodal improvement plans come before us. Uh, we also explored partnership for microtransit, ride sharing, car and bike sharing, and we've been meeting regularly with operators in our region to get data from them. Many of them are thinking or are uh, deploying these type of services on a limited basis. Um, we want to make sure that all of our goals uh, are in uh, aligned and that uh, we are clear on what the anticipated outcomes should be. Uh, this summer, we partnered on a promotion with Waze Carpool that offered VTA employees free rides to and from work. Uh, this promotion saved the employees over 10,000 miles as a result of carpooling. And it was just a way to showcase uh, what carpooling can do for the region and how it can help. It's not the full solution, but it's certainly a better solution than driving solo. 
Uh, we also had a test group for the Ford Go Bike dockless bike program in partnership with the city of San Jose. So these ca test cases are helping minimize the carbon footprint, reduce congestion, and optimize mobility. And we're also showcasing them to the employees along our corridors so that they can see that there are better ways to moving people. Lastly, uh, we're working collaboratively with the cities and county to promote uh, several of our complete street projects. And we hope that they're fully embraced because they really are uh, one of the best solutions. And we're not the only county that's doing complete streets. Uh, many counties around the country are in there and everyone's singing the praises of what it does. It really brings uh, the multiple solutions to how we can all share the same space, whether you're in an automobile, a mass transit um, vehicle, or if you're walking or biking. And uh, so with all of the great things that we were able to accomplish and all of the challenges that we were able to pole vault over, what did we learn? We learned that 40% of our employees eligible to retire and we need to ramp up our training efforts because the skills of today may not match the jobs of the future. That we are data rich and need to continuously use and mine the information to help solve problems of declining ridership and mobile workforce management. That VTA subsidies are not an unassailable entitlement. We need to grow our ridership and significantly increase our fare box recovery ratio. That the best technological innovations cannot succeed unless they're supported by the strength of employees who truly believe in the organization they work for and collaborate in our combined success. And that regional leaders need not to just work together but make a difference through intentional partnerships focused on outcomes that create the change to make our transportation system better by increasing regional understanding of the importance of transit and mass transportation to a reliable transportation network. So I'm very confident that we are well positioned uh, for the year ahead. Change will continue to disrupt and challenge our industry, and we need to take the steps to have meaningful conversations to ensure that our relevancy is never in doubt. My team and I are up to the challenge, and we will remain focused on delivering quality, reliable service today while testing and experimenting with new service models. In the year ahead, we will focus on cementing a path to fiscal stability, improving transit services, and congestion mitigation priorities. And we will be intentional and bold within the auspices of not being too crazy. Uh, early in the year, we will hold the Future Transportation Workshop. It is critical that the board and staff come together to talk about the high policy level issues that we're facing in delivering our mission. Certainty of federal funds, retooling our business model, there's just a myriad of things that we need to tackle. And out of that workshop, I am going to recommend to the board that we develop a mobility action plan, one that guides our transportation system with a focus on mobility, equity, safety, sustainability, and smart technology so that we can improve connectivity, access to opportunity, and quality of life for everyone, and improve also our ridership numbers, of course, and that we need to ramp up our training efforts to upskill and reskill our workforce. So in addition to all of our successful programs, like the Leadership Academy, the Joint Workforce Initiative between Labor and Management, our Tuition Reimbursement Program, and partnerships with, uh, with counties, both Santa Clara and San Mateo on their regional in internships, we are also looking to launch a Don't Overlook program. This is a partnership between VTA and local service agency, social service agencies to identify and train homeless individuals in our county for jobs at VTA. And uh, finally, to enhance, uh, continue enhancing our safety and security processes and tools so that we can improve our customer satisfaction. And of course, delivering first class services uh, to every, uh, in everything that we do. So that is my commitment to you. And again, I appreciate your support this last year. This uh, organization believes in its mission. We are adaptive, nimble, and always ready to adjust and course correct at your direction. Thank you. Thank you, Nuria. Thank you for your exceptional leadership over the last year and to your entire team. Uh, in particular, uh, I just want to point out that I think that expedited project uh, delivery approach uh, for BART is one that 
I know not many cities knew anything about because I talked to a few mayors who asked me about it. Uh, and uh, it, I know it was your idea to get us into that. And we have a real opportunity here. I know it's still very competitive. I think we have uh, seven other cities we're competing against, but this is, uh, this is gonna be a great opportunity for us. I just had one question um, because I know many of us go and visit employers. I probably go to see uh, the lead the CEO or manager of an employer in my city three or four times a month. And I'm often talking about, in the past it was Echo Pass, I guess now Smart Pass. And it would be really helpful if there was a point of contact in, within DTA who could tell us both whether or not a company's already signed up and where we can get materials and make sure that we have them in hand so when we meet with them and say, hey, uh, here's a solution for your employees who are stuck in traffic. And uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we do have that information. Uh, Bernice and Elise, uh, Elise is here. The, um, the group that uh, puts this information together is under her ages, and I am going to ask her to create a pamphlet uh, that not only lists all of the existing employers, but has some talking points about how the program works, what the benefits are. That'd be great. Even an email would be fantastic. Okay. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. I know many of us could take advantage of that. We will do that right away. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank uh, you. I have uh, uh, Mr. Beekman. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to try to add some words to the very nice uh, report you just offered. I hope I can add to you. I don't want to upstage you in any way, but I just wanted to try to add to the... Uh, dialogue that I've been learning how VTA works and if I could offer a few words on that subject that was talked about earlier about I mean it's important to me there's an important balance going on and VTA is unique of the Bay Area cities uh, counties uh, with transportation uh, we're balancing a different set of questions than the other transportation agencies and I really feel for what you guys are going through. And I'm really trying to learn how to practice that. In my mind, you know, what the VTA has to practice is a balance between, you know, innovative private programs, as was spoken by Councilperson Perales, and just a need for good government transportation. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's an important balance. And, I, and I'm learning that both are possible. And uh, that's what I'm going to work on as I talk here. I, I never mean to hurt anybody here. I only want to contribute and, uh, to the process that you guys are continuously building. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other any questions for General Manager? If not, then uh, go to the Government Ma Affairs update. Oh, uh, Director McAllister. Yeah. So it's great to hear ridership is going up. Is that due to the increased number of vehicles with trips that we're generating? Or do we have a reason for looking at that? Um, like everything else, it's the frequency is really what drives ridership. And once uh, we, uh, through our next network program, we identified the need to increase frequency on our light rail. As you may recall, because it serves uh, your city, the Mountain View um, Winchester line was on a 30 minute after peak period. So we're now doing a 15 minute throughout the day. That has demonstrated to individuals that would have otherwise uh, made other choices that there will always be every 50 minutes a uh, train that can get them to where they want to go and and that starts to change ridership and that's one of the recommendations that came back from the ad hoc committee that we look at a 90 10 90 percent frequency 10 percent coverage because we it, it doesn't require a lot of test uh, testing to arrive at the conclusion that the more frequency the more often uh, services available, then the less people have to rely on schedules. They know that they can always go there and if they miss a train or a bus, that there'll be another one in, in short order. And that, uh, that drives ridership. And the frequency is still within our budget? Yes. Um, the change was made, uh, did this happen in the June, January? Yeah, in January we changed, we made the change and uh, that was all um, part of the budget. And the increased ridership of course helps us uh, with revenues as well. And was there anything that you did a couple weeks ago in Washington that you would like to address? Yes, as a matter of fact, let me take this opportunity to thank um, uh, Board Member McAllister who um, attended, uh, uh, I won't say with me, I attended with him, the 
Transit Leadership Summit in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was geared to board members and then also to general managers and the business community that supports public transportation. The Leadership Summit, uh, I will just summarize, was an outstanding, it was very well done uh, because it helped transit board members that don't typically have the opportunity to sit down and hear other general managers and some of the challenges, not only the challenges, but the great uh, best practices uh, that are being implemented in places that may or may not have restrictions on uh, labor contracts, but nonetheless are doing things in the mobility space that uh, is, are worth at least us um, considering, uh, whether in whole or in part. So I really appreciated the, the opportunity that, uh, that you took uh, to be there and that you can now join my voice as well as other board members who have attended uh, the American Public Transportation Association multiple uh, training opportunities to, uh, to help us deliver a better service and a better product to our community and to our county. If you want to say anything. I was going to save that for announcements, but I could do it now. Oh, announcements, okay. All right. Government. No, in closing out my report, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to wish everyone a happy holidays. This is the uh, holiday card that you'll be getting electronically um, over the next uh, few days. And uh, we put out a call to all BTA employees uh, and asked them to dress in red or green. And uh, we were very fortunate that it was a beautiful day, so most of them um, were able to make it uh, from the various uh, bus and rail facilities in addition to our headquarters. So happy holidays. Thank you. Um, thank you, should we go to the government affairs report? Yes, the next, um, the next item is the government affairs report and I am going to invite um, Steve Palmer uh, who is a, our representative. Uh, he, Steve uh, works with Van Skoyak Associates, uh, one of the largest government relations firms in Washington, D.C., and has been in business for uh, more than 25 years. Uh, specifically, Steve has served BTA as our federal lobbyist since 2010. Prior to joining Van Skoyak, uh, Steve spent five years at the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation as Assistant Secretary for Government Affairs and was the legislative strategies, strategist for the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, in full disclosure, Steve and I both work uh, for Secretary um, Federico Peña uh, first and then um, Secretary Rodney Slater uh, in the Clinton administration. And I, so I can speak firsthand for not only uh, Steve's professionalism but his access to all corners of Capitol Hill. Uh, I've asked him, I've invited him again, uh, as he did for us last year, to give us uh, an overview of what to expect with the new Congress and where we are with uh, federal funds. Steve? Thank you very much, General Manager Fernandez, members of the board and uh, board chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Before I start, and I want to make this very brief tonight because I know it's been a long night for you, uh, let me introduce my colleague, Shannon Hanna, who is here tonight as well. Uh, with the two of us do the primary, the bulk of the lobbying in Washington on behalf of VTA. So it's, I appreciate the chance to talk to you, kind of give you a quick update on what's uh, the election outcome and what's, what we see happening in the early part of next year that could be of interest. Uh, oh, oops. There you go. go back. So very quickly, um, you know the outcome of the election. Essentially, uh, the bottom line is, is if you look in the right-hand box, uh, there's still one race that hasn't been called in North Carolina, but Effectively, the House leadership, the majorities have flipped. So there's uh, the working majority for the Democrats will be essentially the same as the, what the Republicans had in this, this past this Congress when they are sworn in on January 3rd. You can see you need 218 votes to, for anything to pass So in the House, and the, and the majority rules. So as long as they can manage the 236, 237, whatever the number is, uh, turns out to be, or I'm sorry, 234, 235, the House will be able to pass the agenda that the Democrats put forward. Uh, in the Senate, there was a two-seat uh, pickup by the Republicans, a net of, net of two there, uh, uh, overall. Uh, so they will have 53-47 in the coming year. The key point, though, is, is that uh, they still need 60 votes to pass any legislation in the Senate. And since the House will be Democratic, the Senate will be Republican, you know, the, the, the expedited process of what they call reconciliation will not be available to them unless they come to some bipartisan agreement. So they won't be passing legislation on 51 vote margins like they did this in the last two years. 
couple, I just want to give you some quick names that I'm not going to go through all of these. These are the new leaders in the House, and I'll touch on the Senate briefly. Uh, it's, you know, these are the people who ha will be touching on transit and transportation over the next two years. Obviously, uh, the leadership is uh, with uh, Senator uh, Nancy Pelosi is not yet confirmed. That has to be, happen on uh, January 3rd. But um, the House Transportation Committee, the new chair is Peter DeFazio from Oregon. He will replace uh, uh, Bill Schuster, who's retiring from Pennsylvania, the Republican who's retiring. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, Peter DeFazio, he's already said that his number one hearing is going to be, first hearing of the year is going to be on the Capital Investment Grant Program what has happened, why it hasn't been working under this administration. I'll get into a little bit more of that in a, in a second. But it's really focused on trying to, uh, as well as you know, when I talk about David Price on the House Appropriations Subcommittee, the two of them are really in the leadership positions to try to make that program more efficient and moving forward as it was uh, in the previous administration. Because, you know, just to touch on it real quickly now, this administration came into office basically saying they didn't support transit and they particularly wanted to eliminate the capital investment grant program. Uh, they have proposed no funding for the program in the two budgets that they've sent to the Congress. But even to the, you know, both parties have strongly supported the capital investment grant program. Republicans have funded it at the highest levels ever. Democrats are positioned now to try to push the program forward because the, the DOT and FDA have been slow in putting that money out in grants. Again, I'll come back to that momentarily, but they are well positioned to be able to do quite a bit to help the program, and, which is important for VTA over the next two years. In the Senate, uh, essentially no change. Oh, and let me go back one second. I just want to mention, uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, it's nice to have the, the Santa Clara Valley uh, members of the House are now in the majority. That's a position of strength in which you, they can help you tremendously, too. But, you know, as we look at these two committees, the Transportation Committee and the Appropriations Committee, the, the other members of the California delegation will be enormously helpful to us. There are six members in total on the uh, transporta Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, including several from the Bay Area. There are three on the Appropriations Committee, including Barbara Lee from uh, the East Bay Area. So we will be using those resources as we try to advance VTA's agenda in terms of working with those other members of the California delegation. In the Senate, Senator Feinstein, Senator Harris, but particularly Senator Feinstein, given her position on the Appropriations Committee, is going to be key. Uh, there really aren't any changes in terms of the leadership, with the exception of the Finance Committee. Senator Grassley, who had been chairman of the Judiciary Committee, moves over and takes over in the, in, in the Finance Committee. So, opportunities, challenges. It's too early to try to say what's an opportunity and a challenge right now. So, you know, let's talk about them both in the same context. Um, the federal budget, for one of the first things that needs to be done in Washington is a new budget agreement. Two years ago, they, they worked out a budget deal that essentially added more money for defense and non-defense spending. Uh, that money uh, now, as a result of that, uh, has to be you know, extended or agreed to again for another year or two. If it doesn't, budget sequestration or the across-the-board cuts come back. That is bad enough for uh, domestic programs, but for defense programs, it would be crippling because it would essentially go from $719 billion this year to 540 next year, and they just obviously can't, can't accept that. It's good leverage for the domestic non-defense programs to grow as well, or at least to sustain their funding. Uh, appropriations, just earlier today, the, the, the half of the government has been funded for the full year. The half that hasn't includes the Transportation Housing Appropriations Bill. Just today, the House and Senate passed a two-week extension to fund the government through de December 21st. Uh, the, the real slowdown or hang-up has been the funding over the southern border wall and how that will be handled in the final appropriations bill. So not that two weeks will necessarily solve the problem, but because of President Bush's funeral, they decided that they would at least kick the can down the road a couple of weeks. And I just listed the grants, not because, you know, we're going to talk about each of them individually. I do want to mention the last one. Because something that is important to Silicon Valley are the automated vehicle, uh, the development of the automated vehicle, vehicle technology. And uh, we were at meetings, I was with the general manager last week, but in separate meetings uh, at FTA, the research office is, is putting together a solicitation for uh, $60 million in grants uh, for automated vehicles. And that's multimodal. It's not necessarily just transit or cars. But it is an opportunity that I think that we want to explore with you uh, when those solicitations come out early next year. They say probably there'll be some in January and a couple more later in the year. I mentioned the Capital Investment Grant Program. Uh, DOT and FTA have been slow. Uh, the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, has been is expressing support for everything the VTA is doing is 
as the general manager said, talking about the expedited project delivery program. I think it's important to note that, that you all are helping define that program uh, because they really don't know which direction to take it other than the broad parameters that Congress included in the FAST Act authorization. So the conversations that, that you and the general manager are having have been enormously helpful in shaping that. But in the meantime, Congress has been slow in putting that, or I'm sorry, the Federal Transit Administration has been slow in pushing that money out. Congress has really put some strong, some strict deadlines on them. In last year's appropriations bill, for example, they said that they directed that FTA has to award 85% of the, of the $2.6 billion in grants by, next, by the end of the next calendar year. Now, that's never been done. Seems like a long time to, to me, it probably does to you too, that they have effectively 20 months to be able to, to award those grants. But they're feeling a lot of pressure because they're trying to now, have, they are forced, FTA is forced to make to work with the transit agencies, the grantees, to make sure their projects are ready to go because they need to get that money out. Um, it's a very positive step, and I mentioned the two members of Congress in the House next year that will really be putting their feet to the fire at, at DOT and FDA to make sure that gets done. There's a lot of talk about an infrastructure bill. No one knows for sure if it's gonna happen, but it is one of the three priorities the House Democrats have that coming into the majority next year, health care, ethical, uh, political uh, reform is another, is a third. So it is one of their top priorities. Um, obviously, the, the key issue is, is, reauthor is uh, funding. Where do you come up with the revenue to be able to support any kind of uh, in infrastructure investment bill? It will not be the same infrastructure kind of format that President Trump talked about last year. Gone is the 2080, you know, the 80-20 flip to 2080. Gone is the only fo sole focus on public-private <coughs> partnerships. I think there, there's a desire to try to uh, emphasize those and include those in, in any kind of infrastructure bill, but those are not going to be the, the sole touch points for that, any legislation like that. And it will be more than transportation. When we talk about infrastructure, it's going to be, it's really going to be up to the people who are now in power. It could be schools. It could be broadband, rural broadband. I think there's a lot of interest in trying to put money into a lot of different areas. Fast Act reauthorization expires in two years. Hearings will start early next year. It's another opportunity, I think, for VTA to get to present itself both to the new House as well as to the Senate in terms of focusing on the innovative approach you're taking on the phase two. Um, highway trust fund solvency still remains an issue. Uh, the good news is uh, the, the people who handle transit issues in the Senate and House really want to make the program work. The staff initiated a meeting, the, the, the Senate and House staff initiated a meeting with a number of transit agencies last week, and it was really just, they, they asked the transit, uh, uh, the directors that were there, say, tell us what's working and what's not working, and how FTA is possibly slowing the process down. We want to make it work better for you. So there are a lot of advocates and a lot of supporters we have in the Congress. Those were staff levels, the meetings. And then lastly, there's a lot of talk about earmarks returning next year. We don't know until it happens, uh, you know, there's going to be some reluctance some, at the leadership level, but if you talk to almost any Democrat who's in the majority or who's in the leadership position on the Appropriations Committee, Nita Lowy from New York, uh, Peter DeFazio from Oregon, they've all said they want to bring back earmarks. And I think that would not only be an appropriations, it would be an infrastructure bill and it would be in the FAST Act. And, and I think the key to, to, to say is, is it would be focused on public agencies initially. I don't think it would necessarily reach corporate entities like it was in the past. So. There are going to be some significant opportunities, I think, to help secure additional funding for VTA in the coming year, year or two years. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman, and turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Really appreciate uh, the information and your advocacy. Uh, questions? Mr. Palmer? No? Okay, I know I'll be back in Washington next month. I may come by and, and see Great. you. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on my uh, in my report is the information uh, we received information on the Silicon Valley Rapid Transit program update. Dennis Radcliffe. Uh, I'm sorry, as Gary's already stated, uh, that uh, we have uh, advanced quite a bit on the communications equipment replacement. Uh, we have indeed uh, uh, received all the equipment that needs to be replaced. Uh, we've also engaged the original equipment manufacturer in a very positive way, and they have uh, 
provided input to the plan for replacement. Sometimes replacing the equipment has some sensitive uh, uh, protocol to, to do without uh, complicating things further, and that has been a great help to both BART and BTA to give them confidence and to uh, ferret out all the risks associated with that plan. Things are going quite well. Nuria had indicated that it uh, be done in uh, Q1. Uh, looks like it might be done actually earlier than we had originally planned. I'll cover that in a minute. Uh, uh, the uh, FTA workshop uh, did occur in uh, November. Uh, the BART organization provided some of the highest level of its management staff to this workshop. And uh, over a two-day period, we covered uh, all of the issues of concern to both BTA project management staff and the BART operating division staff. Um, a number of new risks were identified. The good news is that uh, most of the risks, if not all of the risks, are highly mitigatable, as we call it. In other words, there are a lot of uh, management actions that can be taken to reduce the risk from occurring. And in fact, some had already occurred before the workshop had concluded. Uh, also, most of the risks were within the 90-day period uh, beginning in mid-November, so in the next 60 days we will have either encountered or eliminated or, or uh, uh, overcome the risks that were identified. This is such a dynamic uh, circumstance that FTA had agreed to reevaluate uh, our progress in uh, late January. Uh, on the schedule, this is the same schedule I presented uh, at last month. Uh, the uh, light blue bars there are indicating kind of the main groups of activities. Uh, just to jump to the second bar, this is where most of what we call uh, Unified Optical Network or UON uh, system equipment is being replaced. Uh, that bar indicates, and our original plan for that was to conclude that uh, in late January. It looks like we might actually finish that this month. Uh, that's very good. There are other activities that are taking place, so um, we will watch uh, the progress of these bars, and I'll track them here in all of my updates to come. Uh, the uh, one item I've added to this uh, schedule is the diamond there in the center of the page, yellow and uh, red. This is a critical milestone identified uh, by the workshop with FTA, and so it's kind of obvious. This is where we begin to turn the facilities over to BART. And that's indicated at the end of February. Uh, we show about a month here to do that. It may take less than that, but that's the uh, time we've allocated for it. The reason why it's identified as a critical activity is it is uh, a clear handoff of responsibilities. So all of the risks, or most of the risks that we're talking about, are occurring in the blue bars, which is primarily VTA's responsibilities. Another thing that came out of the workshop is BART uh, confirmed wholeheartedly that six months is what they need to perform their last two activities, that being the systems integration testing at OCC and the pre-revenue operations uh, in, in the last 90 days leading to revenue service. So for now, this schedule looks like it uh, is a reliable schedule. Uh, we'll know a lot more at the next month's briefing because we will should have uh, completed that first bar and we'll have a, a much better sense of how long the second bar will take. Um, the O&M agreement, I uh, won't go through all of that, but uh, we are s scheduling it for or, or planning for February for the board to act on that. Uh, so some information about that should be coming in the weeks to come. For the phase two update, as Nuria indicated, uh, we did submit an expression of interest uh, on the expedited pro project delivery pilot program. Um, uh, was uh, came as quite a surprise as a deadline on November 17th, but I believe we submitted it a day early, um, and uh, we're pretty confident in the content that we pr presented. Also, as Nuria indicated, the General Engineering Services consultant uh, we're planning to bring to the board in January. Uh, we still have to ne negotiate the, the details of that. Um, but this is a critical procurement for us. It will do all of, this will perform all of the engineering throughout the life of the project and it will support the um, final uh, application for federal funding uh, late next year. Uh, we have to uh, take the design from conceptual level to what's essentially a preliminary engineering level of approximately 30 percent for the key areas, and that will inform the estimate uh, that we would be putting into our application as well as the schedule estimate. Uh, the other uh, eligibility requirements, as Nuri had indicated, are the public-private partnering program, or, or elements of it, and the joint development or transit-oriented joint development in our environmental document is the key piece of that, and we are already beginning the work around that, but 
when it comes to um, the details of how that would come together to support uh, any kind of an arrangement with development. Uh, we need some engineering, and again, the engineering services contract is a key piece of that. And that concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dennis. Questions about the update? All right, uh, Sean Mulligan. So good evening, a uh, long time to see. I have some good news for once. Uh, recital item A of the November 2001 VTA BART Comprehensive Agreement states, in 27 prophetic words of almighty importance, uh, VTA and BART acknowledge that the proposed SBRT project must be planned, designed, and constructed under the auspices of a joint BART-VTA policy body. That must be done is what the <coughs> BART and VTA board said in 2001. On page 10, the agreement states that the project will be planned designed and constructed by this body. This will be done. That's what the Barton VTA board said. Here's the good news. The good news comes from a higher power. The California legislature, in its wisdom, has enacted new legislation with the effect of calling forth an unforeseen level of humility of those at VTA, specifically those who designed VTA board agendas, and especially the elected officials among them, in the um, rise and resurrection of this policy in January 2019. I believe this month, Jan uh, December 2018, will be the December to remember as the details of the second coming of the joint policy body are worked out. Hopefully the second coming of this joint policy body will bring great peace and joy to VTA staff and its chairperson. Um, I hope we can all look forward to a, a happy January 2019, and that's the good news. Thank you for the good news, Mr. Morgan. Okay. Uh, we are... Uh, is that the conclusion of the chairperson's report? Uh, the, thank uh, you very much. Um, that concludes our report. I would like to note that the ridership safety and security data are in your folders. Great. And let's see here. Mr. LeBron, you wanted to speak on this item, it looks like? Extremely yep. brief. Great. But it basically segues into to what I said earlier about getting into an ENA with Google. Because when you do that, you will be able to bring them to the party. Right now, you got the city, you got the high speed rail, um, and you got the VTA, and, and I forgot who else. And the two elephants in the house are missing from the party, and that's Google, and that's Bart. If you now give them the land, you can then have them as a partner and design this fully integrated station. So I just thought I'd put it out there. Here's your Petri opportunity. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're on to uh, my favorite part of the agenda, the chairperson's report. Uh, we have an action under 8.2. That's the approval of the meeting schedule for 2019. I want to note that the January 2019 meeting will be held on Thursday, January 10th at 5.30 p.m., which is the second Thursday of the month, just to trip everybody up. Uh, do we have a motion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, now uh, I'd also like to announce that VTA is offering free, that's right, I said free, transit service during the last evening of 2018. Happy New Year's Eve, everybody. Uh, and uh, folks can travel on all light rail and bus lines for free beginning at 8 p.m. on Monday, December 31st until 5 a.m. on Tuesday, January 1st. After 5, I guess everyone's got to pay. And that's one way to sober up. Okay. So, uh, are there any items of concern referral to the administration 8.3? Hearing none. Oh, Councilman Camus. Yes, I, I, I have an item that I uh, wrote a memo on, and it's uh, the first I want to thank the VTA and the San Jose Department of Transportation for their, their time and effort in, in conducting this very important study on Highway 87. Uh, one of the key objectives of the study was to provide a high level assessment of the technology-based improvements that could address traffic congestion at a lower cost than infrastructure modifications. Um, and based on that report, I'm introducing this memorandum to, to direct staff to research funding options for designs for part-time lanes along State Route 87. Uh, the final report stated that there, there are three of the part-time uh, connector ramps are in the high priority improvement list. Getting funds for these design would help us to get to the next step, and as we, we just heard from our federal funding, there might be 
opportunity to get something shovel ready. This is why I wanted to get things across the finish line here. Uh, I haven't set a deadline for this request, but I'm sure that uh, staff will complete this research as soon as possible. Okay, uh, general manager, would you like to? And, and I thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chair and uh, Mr. Camus. Uh, we recognize the urgency. Uh, this is one of those uh, areas that um, I have, to, I too can add my voice because I was surprised when I started working here that we did not have the ability to ride on shoulders um, like we did in the Northeast of the United States. Mm. Uh, then to learn that there was a pilot program in San Diego that had been under the pilot category for 10 years or more. And I thought, well, we must have learned something with that program. But uh, nonetheless, I, uh, there is a path forward. And um, this referral that you have given us uh, gives us an opportunity to, once again, look at funding, look at ways that we can advance um, these very needed uh, projects and approaches for mobility. Thank you. Thank you. As, a, as the head of the congestion management uh, committee, I really appreciate the time that you've taken to get this across. Um, thank you. And so will many commuters. OK. On to uh, item 8.4. This is an information item. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Director McAllister. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I support totally what uh, the, uh, Director Camus is doing. And I was hoping that somewhere along the line that considering uh, you're going to be looking at using the soldier and asking for uh, permission to do it, if we could also look along Highway 85, SR 85, to use that so that if we could, we're doing it, let's uh, really become a uh, area of uh, opportunity. Yes. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. And I support that request. Okay. <laughs> uh, item 8.4 are, uh, are all the unapproved minutes and summary reports in various VTA committees. We've got several members of the community who'd like to speak. Omar Chatty, would you want to speak on D relating to joint powers boards and regional commissions? followed by Mr. LeBron and Mr. Beacon. Yeah, I'm addressing the Caltrain Joint Powers Board and also High Speed Rail uh, a group. So um, I just want to let you know that there was another death on the tracks of Caltrain uh, at 1 a.m. Uh, the other day, a couple, couple days ago, Caltrain did not announce it because it was the last train. It wasn't going to delay trains, but uh, the Daily Post in their coroner's check of vital statistics found that uh, a t an Eagle Scout, 22-year-olds, had been killed. Um, that makes 311 people now known dead since 1995 when it was decided to use the corridor for high-speed rail in the most dense part of the Bay Area. So again, I want to just call for um, uh, you know using the uh, the excellent success we're having with BART. Uh, let's you know let's consider closing that last 30 miles from Santa Clara to Millbrae. Caltrain's electrification hopefully will be convertible to BART. High speed rail um, uh, joint power board might consider uh, with the two thirds legislative approval. I think it takes two thirds to change a properly elected proposition. They might be able to change the routing if there's a consensus that can be developed between our beloved mayor and Oakland and San Francisco. And we can start being smart and move it there. L let's remember Las Vegas, the high speed rail that's privately funded from Victorville to Las Vegas is going right next to the Coliseum. Oakland has just decided on its Coliseum. So it would be a great boon for Las Vegas. And also with BART around the Bay, it would be great connections for San Francisco and all the airports. So um, I hope that would happen. So uh, the cost, by the way, would be, by my estimate of what it costs to bring BART to, through, through San Jose to Santa Clara, uh, is about $12 billion, which is what it's going to cost to bring high-speed rail to San Francisco, and you still can't cross the Bay with it. So I think it's a right, great opportunity. I just want to float the idea with you and also make a suggestion so we can think ahead. Um, the recommendation that the Caltrain Jane Power Board, Joint Power Board have a safety uh, topic in their uh, uh, message they give us every month so that we know how many, what the uh, accident rate is and the death rates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chatty. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. LeBron? Thank you. So, uh, you know, Caltrain boards and, VT and VTA board meetings, I mean, like, just totally different worlds, you know. I mean, this is so enjoyable. You wouldn't believe the kind of grind we have to go through uh, once a month up in uh, San Carlos. But, but I'm getting really frustrated, and I can give you a bunch of issues we had this morning. Um, we're selling right away uh, because the staff don't know how to calculate how many feet they 
they need to maintain to increase the capacity in the corridor. The example I had this morning, they were off by nearly 15 feet. So they told developer we only need 80 feet. You know what, they need close to 95. So, so that's become an issue. We've got misappropriation of funds for local pet projects that do absolutely nothing to increase capacity in the corridor. And, and now we've got this rail car procurement that's essentially going to cripple our current capacity for crying out loud. So, and then, uh, now we're talking about this one-eighth of the cent sales tax. Well, we all know that Santa Clara County is actually the same amount as San Francisco plus San Mateo, which is $18 million a year. And you know what? That's our one-eighth for BART. We don't really want BART to go and grab that money either. So what are we going to do? Our hero over there, Supervisor Yeager, who was the leader of the uh, VTA team, together with Supervisor Nice and Ash Cowra, actually opened the door for us when they bail Sam Trans out, because what they did, they actually found the funding mm -hmm. to basically repay all the loans for the right of way. And at that point, you triggered section 6.B in the 1996 agreement that says after you repay the right of way, you no longer have every year to approve Sam Trans as the managing agency for Caltrain. And my advice to you in the next six months figure out what we're going to do about this because we can't carry on uh, the way we are with these people. It's got to be something else than Sam Trans. I know you got your, you know, played full with Bart, but, you know, please consider it. Muni's underfoot. Okay. Uh, Mr. Beekman. <laughs> Hi, about uh, the East Ridge to BART regional transportation project, corridor project, I guess. It has many parts to it, and I think one of its parts is the idea of uh, transportation studies uh, on the east side. And I really wanted to mention that uh, the traffic congestion at this time is a very serious concern on the east side. And you know, in being here at the VTA meetings and in San the city of San Jose, there's been a, a really, really good energy around, uh, you know, new pedestrian programs, new bicycle programs, and uh, in San Jose, there's Region Zero. Um, so, you know, there, there's a real important uh, thinking around there, but yet it's not quite connecting to the needs of, of individual drivers in their cars on the east side of San Jose and the traffic congestion that's growing really out of hand there. And uh, I, I don't know how to address the issue, but I thought I would bring it up here. I know you guys are working on it, but I thought I would uh, note it. And, uh, you know, it, it's a complex issue to talk about. And uh, I'm, for, I'm for that I feel there's a really good energy right now in the ideas of, a, of, of a bicycle, not just bicycle, but, you know, pedestrian and, and all different motives, mo mo ways of transportation. And that it's time for the road rage on the east side and just the traffic congestion. I, how do we ask those people that, you know, is it time to shift away from cars? Is it time to prepare for different uh, forms besides gasoline? And uh, so that's about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Beekman. All right, so uh, just when you thought the meeting was over, in fact, we have closed session. And let me remind everyone that we do need a quorum because we have uh, an action item, that is 9.4. So you are all, uh, we look forward to seeing each and every one of you in your beautiful faces in room 157, which I think believe is out the doors and down the hall just a bit. Uh, I decided to suggest that we get out of that hot, muggy room uh, so we could breathe a little bit. We do need to come back into chambers after the closed session. So if you could just take whatever you got and head down the hall. Sam, 8.5. Oh, my gosh, I skipped announcements. Announcement. Forgive me. Director McAllister, <laughs> what would you like to announce? That I attended the APTA conference with the general manager, and it was an exceptional trip. I learned four important items. Well, five is that our general manager is well known and well respected throughout the nation. I, I could not find one person that said, oh, that they didn't know her, that they didn't respect her, that they didn't work for her, that she didn't work for somebody else. So it was very well um, good that we do. Uh, Ken, I guess you said you hired her. That was a great decision. 
Um, I think Ken was alone, by the way. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was around. <laughs> so take it while you can. Um, I learned a lot of best practices. I learned what other areas are doing, which is really nice. If you have an opportunity to attend these conferences or attend the NLC or the League of California Cities, it's very uh, educational. You get to talk to your peers and you see what they're doing and then you can ask them specific questions on how they did certain way. So I really encourage that. Two things that they had, they had this little thing called a boot camp for new, uh, for leadership, for new uh, board members like myself. And a couple of the issues that they came up with was under dual loyalty and where is your fiduciary responsibility? And I remember the first day I was here, uh, the mayor mentioned something about parochial thoughts and so forth. So that I thought that was rather interesting and in how they deal with it. So it's very important that once you put on that VTA hat, you are fiduciary responsible to this organization. And the other item that I thought was interesting is the governing structure. And we sort of talked about the various committees that we had. And I was asking various uh, other board members of how they do their process. And so it's, uh, it was interesting to see how effective these other groups were. And maybe that when we're doing, the, are looking at how information flows to the board, we may look at our committees. But it was well worth attending. And I thank the general manager for allowing me to come. She was a gracious host and tour guide. Thank you, director. All right, we're up then to closed session. Uh -oh. So the board will be dis discussing 9.1A and 9.1D through 9.1G, and we're deferring 9.1B and 9.1C.
No, no, no. Uh, okay. Report out on closed session. Report out. Uh, there were no reportable actions taken in closed session. Okay. So back in open session. Everyone has a memo. I was working on uh, furiously in the last 20 seconds to type up for you. Uh, thank you, Lane. Uh, yes. <laughs> and this, uh, this calls for a Seventh Amendment to the general manager's employment contract and a 3% uh, raise. And uh, we will seek a motion at this time. Motion to approve. Second. All right, any comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Excellent. A voice over here. Oh, here we go, our vice chair. Excellent. Uh, all right, uh, is the meeting adjourned? Yeah, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, Mr. Beekman. Wait. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Happy holidays, everybody. Oh, it says we're not having fun. Okay.